This happened to me a few months ago. My two friends and I decided to take a trip to Los Angeles for fun. Keep in mind that we are from the East Coast and we don't know anybody in LA. On the last day of our vacation, we had to check out of the hotel by 11 a.m. The night before, we had gotten back to the hotel really late, so we ended up sleeping in. We knew that it would be difficult to get completely packed up and ready to leave by 11, so we decided to go to the front desk and request a late checkout of noon. We had done this at another hotel before with no issues, and this place wasn't really at capacity with guests, so we figured it was a reasonable request. I drew the short straw and was tasked with going down to the front desk. The elevator in this hotel was really old and quite small, and I found it to be very creepy. I also have mild claustrophobia, so I avoided the elevator and walked down the three flights of stairs instead. I asked the receptionist if we could have a late checkout and gave her the room number. She looked at me surprised and said, Yes, we approved your late checkout already, a few minutes ago. I was very confused and I asked her to elaborate. Apparently a girl had come down a minute or two before me to ask for a late checkout for our room number and then had walked out of the building. At this point, I figured that maybe one of my friends had, for whatever reason, decided to take the elevator down and ask before I did. I grumbled a bit at this because I had just walked down those stairs for no reason at all, and it didn't make any sense why they would ask me to go and then beat me to it. But I got back to the room, and to my surprise, both of my friends were there. One of them was taking a shower, and the other one was packing. It didn't look like either of them had left the room. So, I was kind of like, alright, which one of you's the prankster? They were pretty confused and asked me to explain. So I told them what the receptionist had said, and they were shocked. Neither of them had left the room, and it seemed too big of a coincidence that somebody would have the same request as us at the same time and just make the mistake of giving our room number. I have no idea who that girl was that made the request. They started joking that maybe it was me from another dimension or something. But yeah, whatever it was, the whole thing was kind of eerie. I never really gave much credence to stories about the unexplained or the supernatural. Ghosts, UFOs, cryptids. I lumped them all into the category of campfire tales and tabloid fodder. But one late night drive through the desolate stretches of Arizona's highways changed all that. I was traveling from Flagstaff, a drive I'd made countless times before. It was around 1 a.m. and the night was as clear as it gets the sky peppered with stars. The highway was empty, save for the occasional truck or car that would zoom past, a fleeting encounter with another soul in this vast, dark expanse. My playlist was running low on songs and my caffeine high was starting to wear off. I told myself another hour and I'd be in Flagstaff, out of this car, in bed. That's when I saw it. The shape or rather shapes, far ahead on the road. As I got closer, the shapes started to take form. They looked like animals, but not any animals I'd seen before. They were large, too large to be coyotes, and their gait was awkward, kind of hunched and erratic. I slowed down as I approached them. They seemed to be crossing the highway, completely unbothered by my car. The first instinct was to grab my phone and snap a picture, but as I reached for it, one of the creatures turned its head to look at me. Its eyes glowed an eerie, unnatural shade of yellow. I froze, my hand hovering over the phone. The look in those eyes was unsettling, inexplicably so. It wasn't just animal curiosity. 
It was almost as if it recognized me, or recognized that I recognized it. And then, as swiftly as they had appeared, they were gone, disappearing into the scrub and cacti on the side of the road. I sat there, still slowed to a near halt, my hands trembling on the wheel. I drove off, my heart pounding and my mind racing. Rational explanations came and went. Desert mirages, maybe? Or perhaps they were just animals distorted by the dark and my own sleepy imagination. Yet that look, that haunting, penetrating gaze stayed with me. When I finally got to Flagstaff, I couldn't shake off the unease. I looked up local legends and folklore about Arizona's highways and found tales of skinwalkers, shape-shifting creatures from Native American folklore. Could that be what I encountered? I didn't know, and I wasn't sure I wanted to find out. Since that night, I have avoided driving that stretch of highway, always opting for alternative routes even if they add time to my journey. I've also stopped scoffing at tales of the unexplained. After all, there are things out there in the dark, lonely roads of Arizona that defy understanding, and I've seen them with my own eyes. In 2018, a group of friends from college and I decided to go and spend a month in Berlin over the summer. We spent our time between part-time jobs, partying, and just simply enjoying the city and its cultural activities. Everyone in the group was cycling places, but not me. We had a bit of a bike situation with mine, and so I decided to spend the rest of our time there on foot, or using the metro. It wasn't that much of a bother, until we decided to go and party near the River Spree. This place has bars and clubs, and it's overall a great place to party. But from what I recall, public transportation didn't go that far in the middle of the night. They had all cycled there, so I was the only one without a means to go back to our apartment. It was a 20-minute cycle from the bar, but it was at least a 35-minute walk. A friend of mine, I'll call her Ava, decided to walk back with me and just take her bike next to her so that she wouldn't leave me alone wandering around the city in the middle of the night. It was about 4 a.m. by the time we left. As we're walking down this rather big street and chatting, I remember smelling food and seeing this restaurant past the pedestrian crossing to which we were headed. I'm a foodie and I was rather hungry, so that was pretty appealing. A woman was sitting there having some kind of food. She had black hair. I could see her profile through the large windows, which took up almost the entire wall up to the ceiling. I specifically remember thinking, that's weird that they're still open at this time of night. I remember telling myself I had to tell Ava about it when the flow of conversation allowed it. As I was walking and starting to cross the road, the crossing in front of the restaurant, things got kind of blank. It's like I was on autopilot. I was hearing her voice, but it was kind of muffled. Once we were past this restaurant, Ava stopped, turned to me and said, wait, wasn't there a restaurant just there with a woman eating? I had completely forgotten to tell her. It's like my memory had been wiped and restored within seconds. And there it was, a hotel. The large windows were the same, and inside was the hotel's restaurant, with a layout and tables that looked nothing like what we saw, and nobody was sitting there eating. We were both very shocked and saw that a male receptionist with short hair was in there, I knew we just had to ask him if somebody had just been eating there. It was just too weird. He was a little bit freaked out about us coming in like that, but he said he'd been alone in there for hours. After discussing with Ava, we found out that she also saw the woman eating, but she only saw her back. She was seated with her back to the window. 
while I could tell everything about this woman because I saw her entire profile. After that, Ava never wanted to talk about it again. She got mad whenever I tried to bring it up. People seemed to have changed around me after this event too. Even my mom started to not remember things that she should have remembered. And a lot of people just seemed different overall. I must also note that I was not drunk, not by a long shot. And staying up that late was really common for me at the time. So I didn't feel sleep deprived either. Also, Ava saw the same thing I did. Interestingly enough, the name of the hotel that was originally a restaurant when we saw it is the Grimm Hotel, in reference to the author of many fairy tale stories. All in all, a very weird experience. The location for this story is Iao Valley Road in Maui, Hawaii. There was a full moon and we were in our teens. It was four guy friends and I and we were told to park our car under a tree where somebody had apparently hung themselves and the spirit would push your car uphill as long as you didn't look back. The first time we tried this it was extremely slow, barely inching uphill, then stopped a little way up the hill. I drove back around to the spot where we were at to try it again. They all kept saying, don't look back or the spirit will stop pushing us. So we didn't look back. The car moved faster, like the pace of someone walking. The car had the same jerking movements, like somebody was pushing it. There were a few moments that the car would completely stop and then it moved some more. We made it a little farther down the road this time. We were getting really excited. My friends wanted to do it again, but with proof that I was not pushing the gas pedal. So while I was in the driver's seat, I parked under the tree, the gear was in neutral, and I had my feet hanging out the car window as proof that I was not pushing the gas pedal. The car started moving. My friends were laughing, pointing at my feet, saying, hey, who knows, maybe we'll go faster this time. I saw the car accelerating quickly on its own, climbing 30, 40, 50 miles per hour. We were flying up the hill, and now we were all screaming with pure terror. I tried to get my feet out of the window back in the car as quickly as I could so that I could apply the brakes. Easier said than done. I felt all tangled up and a bit stuck in that awkward position while steering the car. We had sharp turns that you just shouldn't be doing at that speed. By the time I got my feet to the brakes and applied them, we were all the way up the hill where the stop sign was. I could have easily hit oncoming traffic if I hadn't been that lucky. My friends told me that they were so scared that they wanted to go to church and never do that again. Urban legend says there was a guy who climbed on top of his car to hang himself. So that's why he pushes other people's cars away so that they won't do the same thing. It was a sunny day in Hawaii. I was in my bedroom watching TV when suddenly the loudest knocking on my bedroom door happened. Bam, bam, bam. It was like there was a SWAT team ready to break down my door. I was a teenager and home alone. It was in the afternoon. I jumped up, pissed, thinking that it was my older sister. I was ready to kick her butt if I needed to. I went to the door to see that no one was there. I quickly looked at each room. Each door was open, showing me that nobody was there. I went outside and ran around the house looking for her in pure rage, but I saw no one. I returned to my bedroom and I heard mumbled voices like someone was talking in the other room. So I checked every room again and ran outside just to return and only hear those mumbled voices in my room. I checked again in the other rooms and there was no noise. It was only happening in my room. Talk about driving me insane. It made no sense to only hear these mumbled voices in my room and nowhere else. 
My high school sweetheart came over that day and I told him what happened. His mom had just passed away a week prior. I had never met her, but he confessed to me that he had hidden her engagement ring in my room. I told him that I didn't want that ring in my house. He said okay and asked to be in my room alone so he could talk to his mom. I said, okay, that's fine, but you still have to store her ring somewhere else, not in my house. I feared that his recently passed mom might not have liked me from number one, not knowing who I was before she died, and here I am with her personal belongings. And number two, she might not have liked my relationship with her son for some other reasons. She was a bit of a bigot. So you know, I was scared at this point thinking these things and now knowing that what happened was supernatural. I guess whatever my high school sweetheart said to his mom worked because the mumbling voices stopped and nothing weird ever happened again. So the house my grandparents owned when I was younger had a lady in the basement. At least that's what I called her. My older sister called her the lady on the landing because she only ever saw her on the landing to the basement. Either way, basement. I haven't correlated any of my personal stories with my cousins or siblings except my own. My aunt used to live down there and I haven't dared try to ask her about it because she had an experience when she was younger where she was physically lifted out of bed by her ankles. And because of that, you can't even mention ghosts or paranormal things because she literally covers her ears and walks away. But that's another story for another day. Anyway, these are my personal stories and I'll try to keep them short and sweet. The first time I can recall seeing her, my aunt, a different one than the one I just mentioned, was over at my house with her son. We were all hanging out while my mom was working and my grandparents were in Hawaii. Now, for some reason, she chose to bathe me in the basement bathroom, which was weird because there was another fully functional bathroom with a bathtub on the second floor of the house, as well as a shower in my grandparents' room. My cousin was expecting his friends to come over and play and the doorbell rang, so my aunt ran up to answer it, but had my cousin stay with me. I was maybe three or four at the time and he was about nine so she wanted him to keep an eye on me so I didn't drown or anything. She called him up to go play with his friends, and as soon as he left the bathroom and was halfway up the stairs, they were pretty creaky so you could hear where he was, the door slammed shut and the lights turned off. All of a sudden, I see this woman literally in the mirror facing me, but it looked like she was getting ready to walk out of it because she was getting closer. Of course, I started screaming, my cousins on the other side of the door desperately trying to get in. My aunt comes flying down the stairs and couldn't get the door open either. She kept telling me to unlock the door, but hello, I'm stuck in terror and I'm also like four years old. Finally, she gets the door open and sees nothing. She flips on the switch and gets me out and nothing was ever really said about it. Later that week, I was again with my aunt as my mother was working. I asked if I could sleep in my grandma's bed since they weren't there, and at the time, at my little tiny size, that bed seemed humongous. She called them in Hawaii to ask their permission and they said that was fine. So I'm asleep in their bed and I'm not exactly positive if this was a dream or an actual experience that took place, but this is how it went. I was in the center of the bed. From there, you could see straight into their bathroom on the right side of the room and then straight down the hallway into the computer room. Mind you, this is on the second floor now, not the basement. In this experience, the bathroom light flipped on and I could see her again, coming out of the mirror. It was like I was locked in place, but I could see down the hall in the computer room, my mom sitting at my grandma's computer. I tried calling to her, but it came out as just a dull whisper. I tried over and over. Mommy, mommy. Mom, but the sounds wouldn't come out. The woman actually made it out of the mirror this time and got just a step out of the bathroom when I was able to get unlocked and I ran down the hallway into the room that my mother was in. Again, nothing was ever said about this. 
Another time, maybe two years later, my mom and I were sleeping in the basement bedroom and the closet doors were those full floor to ceiling mirrors. I saw her again, but my mother was in reaching distance and I woke her up and she saw this woman too, grabbed me and ran upstairs. I guess a more adequate name for her would be the lady in the mirror, but I've been calling her the lady in the basement for what seems like forever. Even though I've never personally verified this, I know for a fact from other people that my cousin has seen her on a number of occasions. My sister saw her, my brother saw her, and a couple of other cousins did when they would visit from out of state. But it really only affected us kids. Over the past couple of years, I have asked my mother about it and asked if she remembers it. My sister, my aunt that would watch me, and her son, and everyone else is pretty much on the same page of this was real. My mother's theory is that she was a family member from the past that just stuck with the family and didn't mean to be scary. She just was scary because we weren't used to seeing that sort of thing. I asked my grandpa about it last week over text if he recalls me ever saying anything about her. He replied back, no, and I'd prefer it if you didn't. Now, here's the kicker. My grandma passed in December of 2018. I hadn't seen the lady in the basement since that particular house. They moved houses, hell, they even moved states, and I never saw her in any of the other houses, not once. But after my grandma died, I saw her in the house I was living in that wasn't even close to the original house that I had first seen her in. So I'm wondering if my mom's theory on her being a relative that passed and was just attached to us is true, and that when my grandma passed, she followed her but made her rounds to say goodbye or something. I'm wondering this because right after I saw her at my own house, I called my sister immediately and she freaked out because she had seen her at her house the day before. I haven't seen her since, and I pray to God that I never see her again. My story takes place on the big island of Hawaii when I was about 10 or 11 years old. My dad was into hunting wild boars and sheep. Sometimes he would take the family with him to stay at a cabin that my uncles had built. I can't say exactly where the cabin is located, but to get there you'd have to take a turn off the main highway onto an unmarked road, then drive about an hour up the mountain, off-road through the woods to reach the cabin and hunting grounds. It's a small one-story cabin, and the front door is just a sliding glass door. Across from the sliding glass door are the three bedrooms that had two bunks in each room. No doors. The bathroom was just an outhouse with no lights or running water. We had to walk through some bushes and trees to get to it. It was a nice little spot, not ventilated well and cold, but quaint. I couldn't help but feel like there were a lot of spirits there, mostly because my uncle said that a huge battle took place near the cabin during ancient times. I immediately think, damn, night marchers. To some, night marchers are just part of Hawaiian folklore, but to native Hawaiians, they are very real. I was already creeped out by that place. I remember feeling very vulnerable. At some point during that trip, my cousin, sister, and I started to wander around the outside of the cabin in the open area. It was basically a field of lava rock covered with grass, weeds, and trees that lined the outer edges of the perimeter. We were bored, so we grabbed some hammers and started smashing in small lava tubes to see if we could find something. The lava tubes we were smashing weren't giant, like caves, but small, hollow pockets or bubbles of air that formed during lava flow and hardened over time. You could just tap your shoe on them and can tell that it's a pocket by the sound. Well, let's just say, be careful what you wish for, because one lava tube in particular had something in it. We smashed one, looked inside, and what we saw sent chills down our spines. It was a pile of bones sitting on long brown bird feathers. It didn't look like human bones, but some kind of animal, maybe a chicken. Okay, you're thinking, wow, that's not scary. 
but the bones were perfectly preserved and still had some pink and reddish color to it. They seemed fresh. So we started pondering how the bones had gotten there. There was really no physical way that a person could have put those there. Why didn't it get destroyed by the lava? The bones had to have been there for hundreds of years because the volcano was no longer active. It was as if the lava flow went around the bones and hardened over it, protecting it. The only explanation we could think of was that it was an offering to Pele, the fire goddess, and that we probably shouldn't mess with it. We immediately covered the opening with rocks and got the hell out of there. We never told our parents. The next morning, my dad asked us if anybody had gone to the outhouse early in the morning. We all say no. Oh, weird, he said. I woke up and saw someone standing at the sliding door. I thought maybe somebody had gone to the bathroom. We look at each other horrified, like, what if it was the person that left the offerings and we totally disturbed it and were screwed? We asked for more details. He said it was too dark to tell who it was exactly, but that it was a large man and that he just stood there at the door staring into our cabin. My dad tried to play it off like maybe he was just dreaming, but I was terrified, fearing that I had disturbed someone's offering to the gods and that they were mad at me. It could have been a human, but given our location, it seems really unlikely. There were no other cabins or homes built on those hunting grounds. And you'd have to know exactly where it was if you went up there to camp. It's not somewhere that people would just stumble upon. Either way, I have never stayed there again. I moved into an old inn up by the University of Hawaii Manoa campus. Real creepy area. For a college area, you would think that there would be more people out and about, but if I ever drove down into the Manoa Valley at night, it just felt abandoned. Barely a light on in any of the houses. Anyway, I was dating a local and one day at work, my buddies and I got to talking about ghosts and things that we felt while on patrol at night. Obviously, there's a lot of energy surrounding Pearl Harbor. So when I got home, I messaged her and we started talking about my day. No ghosts yet. One of the questions that I asked her was basically, how come she never came to my apartment? Why did I always have to go to her place to visit? In the most serious tone she's ever had, she says, do you really want to know? It's because I can see things. Of course, I want to know more, so I'm like... Define things. And she proceeds to tell me that after her father passed away, she was able to see spirits or whatever, and because the Manoa Valley had a violent history, I guess an old Hawaiian tribal history, she didn't like going down there because it was overwhelming. Needless to say, this didn't make me feel comfortable at all living in my old ass little studio apartment in this creepy old mansion that was turned into an inn by the owners. So now our conversation moves to what I talked about at work, about how I was super weirded out now, because before it was just guys talking, but now my girlfriend's telling me she can see dead people, and things are taking a turn for the strange, and I'm not liking it. I tell her that I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight because I'm officially creeped the hell out. She proceeds to tell me not to worry. She's going to send her grandmother over to keep me company, which she explains won't be her grandmother's ghost, but her grandmother's spirit, and that this sweet old lady's spirit is gonna protect me. Yeah, that didn't help me any, but she reassured me that everything would be fine. Grandma would sing me to sleep and comfort me. Don't worry. <laughs> no way that I'm sleeping that night. No way in hell. Well, guess who passed out shortly after we hung up the phone and slept like a damn baby? This guy, supposedly because of her grandmother. But there was this one thing that woke me up. Around 3 a.m., a beer bottle I had in my sink fell over, woke me up for a fraction of a second. I didn't think twice and I went back to sleep. Go to work, come home, call the girlfriend. And she has a smart ass tone in her voice and says, so how did you sleep last night? Proceeded to do the whole I told you so thing about her grandma comforting me and keeping me safe. And then 
She goes, I'm really sorry about the beer bottle. My grandma didn't mean to disturb you and wake you, but uh, she did make sure you went back to sleep. Yeah, I was creeped out about that for the longest time. Nothing major ever happened after that. I broke up with the girl a couple of months later, but I'll tell you what, crazy couple of months, that's for sure. Back in 2013, I was teaching English in Shukugawa, Hyogo, Japan for a year. It was truly a dream come true. Well, my English center's latest class got out at about 10.30, and with it being Japan, I felt completely safe walking home along the Shukugawa River so late at night. Along my walk, I had to pass under the JR Kobe line and would pass a small Buddhist temple as I came out from under the bridge. Now, I had done this walk dozens of times by now, and nothing scary, let alone mildly unnerving, had ever happened. It was late March, so the weather was cool and comfortable. However, I noticed that as I drew closer to the temple, it got cooler. Cool enough for me to zip up my hoodie and shiver. As I was coming up the path, I heard the distinct sound of someone praying at the altar. The small gong or bell was rung, a 5 yen coin clattered at the altar box, and two claps to announce the prayer's presence to the gods were heard. I stopped for a brief second, thinking it was weird that somebody was out so late to say a prayer, but I shrugged it off and moved on. Turning the corner, I expected to see somebody at the altar, but it was empty. I froze. There was absolutely no way that somebody could have prayed that fast and bolted off without me hearing them along the gravel path. It was then that I noticed how still the night was. No bugs or birds, no sounds of the city, and the river to my left sounded muted. The feeling of being watched and unwelcomed washed over me. Slowly, I began to move, the temple now to my back. I took just a few steps before I heard the bell, the coin, and the two claps. Fear gripped me. I broke out into a cold sweat as the shadows of the trees seemed to grow dark and deep. I gathered my nerves and anxiously turned to face the temple. Nothing but a vacant temple. Slowly I turned and started walking again, and then... I heard two claps, clear as day, right in my left ear. Needless to say, I bolted the rest of the way home. After that night, I avoided passing by that temple whenever I worked the later classes and opted to just take the long way home. I'm not sure where exactly the story fits, or even how to explain what happened that night, but I would love some feedback or insight. I was living in Hawaii temporarily on the Big Island. I was working on an organic farm in the Hawaiian jungle for a witch doctor and shaman. He was such a wonderful guy. I had no cell service in that part of the island, unless I climbed this huge hill for one bar. This hill was made of cinder and lava rock and was created by a lava flow back in the 60s. It was about 100 feet high, maybe taller. The climb was difficult, but feasible. One night, I was very distraught because somebody that I had been traveling with and had trusted became extremely abusive and controlling. I had been keeping my husband informed back on the mainland and frequently checked in with him. I had suspicions that this friend was trying to trap me on the island with him and break up my husband and I. He had been trying to gaslight me and wipe out my self-esteem. The other people that I was traveling with were too scared to stand up to the guy. We got in a huge screaming match that day where I basically put him in his place and told him that I wanted nothing to do with him. 
I started making plans to ditch him and go work on a different farm. The witch doctor agreed. After dark, I go to the room that I was renting, laid down, and tried to calm myself to sleep. I woke up to realize that I had dozens of little fire ants in bed with me and had gotten stung all over. If you're not familiar, little fire ant stings suck. That was really the coup de grace of an already crappy few days. Against my better judgment, I slid out of bed, shook the fire ants off, grabbed my headlight, and began to trek up the treacherous hill to go talk to my husband. It was pitch black, and when I looked up, I could see the Milky Way. I took the meandering path to the base of the hill and climbed it. When I got there, I dialed my husband. Hawaii was six hours behind my hometown, so it was in the early morning hours for him. During the day, people mine the lava rock there and sell it to customers to decorate their yards. While I was talking to him, I suddenly got the horrible sensation that I was being watched from afar. I got the feeling that someone, or something, was up there with me. Something felt very wrong, and my intuition screamed that I was in danger. At first I thought it was somebody living up there that was just investigating me. I listened for footfalls. Nothing. I had been up there during the day and had gotten a really bad vibe before that I had just brushed off as the unknown. The hill was like a narrow cliff, and it was easy to slip off either side because of the unstable lava rock. The feelings I got were unusual because I felt like it hated me and wanted me dead. Almost like it wanted to scare me or even push me off the cliff. I was no stranger to this feeling because I've had other experiences in my hometown that gave me similar sensations. This is where it gets really odd. The air became very heavy and thick. It was suffocating. The insects went silent. The frogs stopped chirping. I could have heard a leaf fall, it was so silent. My breath caught in my chest as I froze. It was like the normal sounds of the outside all went silent at once. The feeling of being watched felt closer and more intense. My headlight dimmed, and this massive black thing engulfed me. It not only engulfed me, but my surroundings as well. I couldn't see the trees or the stars. The only thing that I could see was a few feet in front of my face from the feeble light coming from my headlamp. I was totally surrounded. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe. It was terror unlike anything I have ever felt before. My light got dimmer and dimmer, and this thing felt like it was closing in, gradually, closer and closer. I got the feeling that it was going to push me off the precipice I was standing on. The anxiety I felt was pure fight or flight. I felt a wave after wave of adrenaline surge through my body. I began to shake all over and my knees became weak. I was totally surrounded and engulfed by this black thing. It was the blackest black I've ever experienced. The blackness looked alive somehow. I had never seen anything this dark in my entire life. It felt sentient, like it knew what it was doing. I could barely think. It felt as though I was being embraced by death. If I so much as breathed, I would die. Finally, it was just too close for comfort. I whipped around in circles and snarled. Leave me alone. Now. Get away from me. In my most aggressive, bigger than I felt tone, I tried to sound as mean and as threatening as possible. I know the sound of my voice had to carry on for miles in each direction. In a split second, I felt the heaviness and suffocating sensation disappear. My light was no longer dim. I could see the trees and the stars again. The frogs and the insects gradually started chirping again. Whatever had been there had gone. I hauled ass down that hill, slipping and sliding most of the way. I went back up there during the day over the next few days, and in some parts, it still had a bad vibe. I've given it a lot of thought, and I can't make sense of it. Can anyone tell me what I experienced that night?
I rented a condo in Hawaii at the Hilton Turtle Bay on the north shore of Oahu. FYI, I can get a condo for a week on the hotel grounds for cheaper than a two-day stay at the hotel, so that's what I did. I arrived from California, put my stuff down, and headed out for the beach. After dark, I came back and eventually went to bed. The main bedroom was upstairs. As I'm trying to go to sleep, a woman screams at me from a couple of feet away, telling me to leave. It was really more like, get the fuck out. I'm shocked and rattled a bit. I say to myself, this is just a hypnagogic hallucination, and I try to make myself go back to sleep. I fall asleep and get screamed at again a few minutes later. I got out of bed and I remember actually saying out loud to myself, shit, rented a haunted condo. Then I said, I'm not leaving. I paid for a week, leave me alone, and I won't sleep in your bedroom, but I'm not leaving. The next day, my good friend shows up. I tell him he can sleep in the main bedroom, and he gives me a calculating look. So that night, after some fun adventures, he heads upstairs to go to sleep. I sit on the couch, awaiting the news. He comes down 30 minutes later, and says that I'm a total dick for not warning him about my bedroom. I innocently asked, what are you talking about? He said that some lady was screaming at him upstairs. I cracked up and told him that he's gonna have to sleep on the couch. Tonight I was having dinner at the Manalani Golf Course on the Big Island of Hawaii. I had to use the restroom pretty badly, so I had my husband hold my things as I rushed into the women's restroom around the corner. Normally I get a creepy vibe from public restrooms anyway, but this time it was a lot more than that. I had a tight feeling in my chest as soon as I walked in. There were four stalls and only the second one was closed. I quickly glanced underneath that second stall to check if it was occupied, and it was empty. All of a sudden, I started hearing this wailing sound that progressively got louder as I got closer to the third stall, which I had decided to use. The sound got so loud and terrifying that I just couldn't do it and decided to bolt out of there. As soon as I turned around and started to run, I heard something coming after me. I fumbled with the door a bit because I forgot that it was a pull instead of a push. Once I finally turned out of the corner, the footsteps behind me stopped. There was still nobody there. I saw my husband and said, fuck that. He looked confused. I still had to go pretty badly though, so I decided to just make him come with me. I forced him to enter the women's restroom. At this point, I didn't really care if anybody walked in. As I expected, the noise was gone. I entered the third stall just like I had planned initially, and while I was hanging up my purse, a few charms from my bracelet got caught and broke off. In an effort to make myself feel better, I thought, maybe that sound was just from the toilet flushing or filling back up. Maybe it was the vents. I flushed the toilet hoping that I was right, but it did not make that wailing sound. I washed my hands as quickly as I could and rushed the hell out of there. If you've ever been to use the women's restroom at the Mount Alani golf course next to Shiono, and you've had a similar experience, please let me know. I'm terrified about what the hell just happened, and I'm wondering if I was just imagining things. I used to live on a military base in Hawaii. My father was in the Navy, and there wasn't much to do there. I don't know exactly what my age was at the time, maybe around kindergarten? Hawaii didn't require kindergarten at the time, so I wasn't in school yet. I know that at least. Outside of our house, there was a covered car park that people in the community used because the houses didn't have garages and there were various storm drains that were around the car park. I would always play there since it was right outside of our house. Not the brightest, but kids are dumb, right? So one day I was playing there and I thought it would be fun to drop things down the storm drain to see how far they went. 
I had dropped a couple of rocks and some small sticks, and eventually I ran out of things to throw, so I started saying, hello, to hear my echo. I didn't expect to hear anything other than my own voice, so I was surprised when I got a response. A little girl called back to me. I wasn't scared, I was just confused. I asked her what she was doing down there, and she said that she and her family lived down there. I remember that I kept trying to look closer in, but it was so dark you couldn't see the bottom at all. The storm drain went straight down and was covered by a grate, not like the drain that Pennywise used. We sat for a while and talked. I don't remember the whole conversation, but it went on for a while. I vividly remember the last part of it though, because I felt so guilty and hurt. Years later I still do, even though I'm not sure this even happened. She wanted to play with me and I said that I could invite her in for dinner, and she got really excited by that idea. So I ran inside and asked my mom if my friend could come over for dinner. She said no, and she wouldn't let me go back out to tell her. The next day, I went out to explain to my friend what had happened, but she wasn't there. I never heard from the little girl in the drain ever again. I remember crying that day. I blamed my mom for losing the only friend that I had made there. I would like to write this off, saying that it was just my imagination considering how young I was, but my mom still remembers this happening and how upset I was, and that I told her that she made me lose a friend, so maybe it did. As I write this, the Islamic holiday Eid al-Adha just recently ended. I would like to share with you a story that I heard based on my experience helping out at the mosque for last year's celebration. I was there as a journalist, working on a small island off the coast of Singapore. One of the islands has a small mosque, but they were organizing the lamb slaughtering event to give out to the poor. Many villagers, consisting mainly of Muslims and Christians, received free meat on that day, which also contributed to the next event, which was a large feast especially made for the villagers. I got the chance to aid in that and get free food as well. However, one must understand that with a lot of goats, there will be the foul stench all over and constant blood coming from the butchering area. By nightfall, things would have been kept clean, of course. This story is told by one of the staff there that mentions of a tale that will disturb me forever. There is this story that revolves around the mosque being used by an unknown cult to summon the goat woman. They would use the praying hall in the middle of the night and do some sort of satanic ritual before sacrificing a woman, most of the time a villager, to summon the goat woman. Usually the sacrificed is a young girl in her 20s, a virgin, and she was stripped of all her clothing before she was killed. An axe is placed on the sacrificial table, and several red candles light up before some chanting goes on. And then, the spirit of a demon would enter into the deceased's body and rise, placing the decapitated goat head still fresh on hers. Blood would drip all over her as she picked up the axe and went after the villagers that killed all the goats. When coming after young virgins, their bodies would be crucified, cut, open by the axe and left on the roads to allow all the villagers to see. According to an old man that lived on that island, the cult consists of satanic worshippers that suddenly came to the island and began performing their demonic rituals one day in the forest. Ever since then, there will always be strange noises coming from the forest. The sound of a goat, the screaming of a woman, or the stomping of a large creature. Many people did go missing, but no investigations conducted were able to find them and so their cases all went cold. The villagers managed to, of course, stop the demon with their exorcism and their guns. They summoned a religious teacher to stop the demon, while a priest from the nearby church also aided the villagers. 
However, this account varies, as some say that she escaped into the forest with her cult, coming out each night to kill young girls. This could be the reason why most girls are given curfews, to protect them from the goat woman. I have a weird, ominous topic that I wanted to talk about. I grew up on a small island chain off of the Texas Gulf Coast. Never really experienced anything out of the ordinary until I moved to another island in the chain, North Padre. I don't live there anymore, but when I come to visit, there's this little thing that bothers me every time, and I've heard it ever since I've moved. There's this constant mechanical sounding ring that I can hear. It's always there. It's hard to describe, but I know exactly what direction it's coming from. The ocean. I have no idea what's making it. I always hear it coming from a certain point on the island. Ships tend to stay far away from this point, so I don't think it's a horn, especially since it's very rhythmic. The sound is very low, I always hear it in the back of my head. Sometimes I won't hear it for an hour or so, and I feel fine when it stops. When it starts up again, I get a really bad headache, and sometimes I can get confused or dizzy. I was told by my boyfriend that I'm most likely hearing the hum of the earth, but to me it's more like a ringing. I don't hear it anywhere else other than Padre. When I stand on the beach, I can point directly to where it's coming from. It makes it really hard to sleep, and I always feel on edge, like something awful is going to happen. I don't know if anyone else experiences this where they live, or if they've been to North Padre and have heard this noise, but I just thought it was an interesting story. For the longest time, when I actually lived on the island and wasn't just visiting my parents, I assumed it was the lighthouse. I'm not sure why I assumed this, but it seemed to make sense in my mind. It turns out the island does not and has not ever had a lighthouse. When I learned that, that's when I started getting that awful feeling from the sound. Before it would bother me, but I just brushed it off, thinking that it could be reasonably explained and that I was being irrational. Anyone I've ever talked to about it says that I have hearing problems, or that I'm being overdramatic, other than my boyfriend, who has tried to hear it with me but can't. I've always had sensitive hearing, and over the years I've been clinically diagnosed with PTSD, and I have developed a trigger for alarms and rings, especially fire alarms, even though I've never been in a fire. I've gotten a whole lot better at picking out individual sounds and where they're coming from, I use this to calm myself and figure out why something is going off so I can rationalize it and not have a panic attack. So far, I haven't found an explanation that quite fits for this sound, and I think that's what bothers me the most about it. I can't rationalize it, because every time I do, somebody disproves my thinking. Like the lighthouse, the ships, the military base, church bells. We have one teeny tiny airport, the military base is all the way on the other side of Corpus, and out of the four churches on the island, only one has a bell, but it's broken. I'm always on edge and anxious, as I have no idea where it's coming from. I mean, the actual source. I just know the direction. Maybe I am just a crazy person whose PTSD has taken over, but I sincerely believe this sound is real and coming from the ocean. I've always been fascinated by my family history, which led me on a journey to a remote village in Connemara, Ireland. My family's roots were supposedly traced back to this quaint, picturesque place. The village was the kind of place where time seemed to stand still, with rugged landscapes and a deep sense of history. 
I visited the local parish to learn more about my ancestors. The parish priest was kind enough to let me look through the old records. I spent hours poring over dusty ledgers and faded manuscripts, tracing back generations of my family. But as I delved deeper, I stumbled upon something unsettling. There were records from the late 1800s that hinted at a sinister secret in the village. It seemed that several of my ancestors were involved in some sort of dark pact or ritual. The details were vague, but it was clear that it was something the village wanted to forget. The more I asked around, the more I felt a resistance from the locals. It was as if there was an unspoken agreement to keep the past buried. However, an elderly villager eventually confided in me. She spoke of an old legend, a tale of a pact made with a malevolent force that promised prosperity in return for unspeakable acts. The legend was tied to my family, and the impact of their actions seemed to linger in the village. Strange occurrences, unexplained disappearances, and a lingering sense of unease were all mentioned in hushed tones. I left the village with more questions than answers. The beautiful landscapes of Connemara now seemed to hide a dark, troubled past. The truth about my family's history was more complex and disturbing than I had ever imagined. Back home, I often think about that village and the secret it's guarding. It's a reminder that sometimes, in searching for our roots, we may uncover truths that are darker than we're prepared to face. Connemara will always be a part of my history, but now it's a place shrouded in mystery and shadowed by a past that refuses to be forgotten. This is what I believe to be the truth. I'm totally open to the possibility that it was a hallucination or a trick of the eye or anything else. I'm honestly just looking for some ideas. For some background, I have had some experiences seeing shadow people as a child, but in the past 10 to 12 years, I haven't really experienced anything other than a weird shape in my peripheral vision or a strange feeling of being watched. Nothing too major. That was until the night of the 23rd of December. I couldn't really sleep that night because I'd been working a late shift and was still kind of in an energetic mood. Weirdly though, that afternoon when I was sitting on my bed putting my shoes on, I could have sworn that I felt something touch my foot from under the bed. I didn't really pay much notice to it. I just remember thinking, oh, that's weird. But it was the middle of the day and I was running late. Anyway, that night, once I did finally get to sleep, I kept being awoken by scratching noises. Now that sounds a lot scarier than it is because we always get mice in our attic at winter, so it really wasn't anything new or scary. However, the third or fourth time it woke me up, it startled me because it sounded different. This time it sounded like, I guess I would say it sounded like someone really lightly running their finger along the wall not scratching at it or anything, just like when someone very lightly runs a finger along a wall. I also noticed that my wardrobe door was open. In my culture, there's a lot of superstition surrounding specifically wardrobe doors being open. I actually have a string keeping it closed, which would have to have been untied in order to open the wardrobe. This immediately made me think that something spooky was afoot, but I was so tired that I was just happy to ignore it. Anyway, I turned on the light and of course there was nothing to be seen, so I got a drink, took a few breaths and went back to sleep. I then woke at about 7 o'clock, lying on my side facing the wall. For some reason I got this overwhelming urge to turn around, and before I knew it I was already rolling over. I noticed that there was what looked to be a shadow man, standing about one meter away from the side of my bed. I got the feeling that it was facing me but peculiarly, it had no head. It wasn't like it had been decapitated or anything gruesome like that. It just had an uninterrupted line across from one shoulder to the other. As well as that, I remember it not having any hands, like its arms just ended in a sort of rounded point. I also immediately noticed that it was quite small, maybe five feet tall, possibly less. 
I'm 5'11", and I could tell it was a decent bit shorter than I. I did not feel threatened at all at the time. I just saw it and thought, oh wow, this is actually happening. And then immediately thought, this isn't what I imagined he would look like. For reference, as a child, I remember frequently seeing a huge shadow figure pretty often. So in my mind, that's what a shadow person was supposed to look like. Anyway, I kind of snapped out of it and dove for the light switch. This meant passing the entity in order to reach the switch. It didn't move or run or anything. It just stood still. When I passed it, though, I did notice a coldness in that area and the air feeling thick or dense. That's really the only word I can think of. As soon as the light was on, it began to fade into like a smoke, but there was still a clear outline of it for a few seconds. The best way I could describe it is like, you know when it's really hot outside and you can see the heat waves rising off the road? Yes, well, it looked exactly like that wavy air, but in the shape of the shadow. I'm from Ireland, and assuming this is one of the Ishi, I asked it to leave in Irish. I then felt the newfound sense of dread momentarily lift. But when I sat back down on my bed to kind of process my thoughts, I felt a rush of cold air come toward me, and I did feel a sense of anger or annoyance. But I can't explain where or what it was coming from. It was almost like the air was angry at me. Naturally, I decided that this was a battle I was not willing to fight, and I left the room. As soon as I closed the door, though, I noticed that my two pet ferrets were both wide awake and had all of their fur standing fully on end. I brought them both into my room then, and they both immediately started hissing and puffing up their fur at something. I've never in my life seen them act this way, so it really did freak me out. I had been hoping to just pass this off as some sort of hallucination, but their actions unfortunately made me feel quite justified in my fears. I initially worried that it was the fear Dorka of Irish folklore, a shadow man of the Ishi who acts as a warning of your death, but it doesn't fit any of the descriptions of him from our mythology, which honestly was the best Christmas surprise ever. Fully thought I was a goner there for a while. Anyway, if you made it this far into the story, thank you, and please let me know if you have any ideas as to what this was, if I handled it wrong, or what I should do in the future. Here are some of my family stories from Ireland. I was about 17 years old, living at my mom's house. I was just finishing secondary school for my trade in painting. A few of my friends and I from school decided to go out and celebrate our upcoming graduation with drinks. I said, haven't we been celebrating graduation all year? And I got a laugh from the boys. We went out to the pub and did what we did every night, drink. Now, on school and work nights, I kept my wits about me, knowing that I had to get up in the morning. Not only that, but the bars back home didn't stay open until 2 or 4 a.m. They'd put you out at about 12, and maybe you'd get lucky and get a crowd in on a Friday or Saturday, and they'd keep you there to make a bit of money. The night went as usual, and I watched the first two of the group say their goodbyes, grab their jackets and hats, and then head out into the dark. Now, you have to remember, Ireland is still a poor country by the standards of the EU and was even worse off than today when I was a teenager in the 70s. Some of the people I grew up with had no plumbing. Most used fireplaces to heat the house. And a couple had no electricity. So when I say they headed into the dark, there were no street lights for miles and there was very limited artificial light. I looked at the clock on the wall. It was 10.30. About 20 minutes passed since the pair had left, and I asked my friend Jerry if he was coming home, since he lived only a few minutes up the road from me. He replied, I'm having a good crack, I'll see you tomorrow. So I left him and headed out myself. The walk from the pub to my house was about two miles or about a 40 minute walk. I said my goodbyes and started out. For some reason, I felt uneasy. I didn't know what was wrong. But walking the dark roads, I walked every night, every day, my whole life, put a knot in my stomach on this night. I got halfway up the road, looked back, and thought about waiting for Jerry to head home with me. 
I knew Jerry was the kind to stay until closing, and I didn't have the money or the energy to keep up with him until payday. So I turned around, reassured myself, and kept walking. About ten minutes into my walk, I heard rustling in the bushes along the road. It sounded big, and I assumed it was a deer. I kept on, and about halfway home, I heard the rustling in the bushes behind me again, followed by a stone hitting me in the head. I turned quickly and said, Quit it, guys, now. Come out. I don't want to be walking the whole way alone. My heart sank. My friends, who I expected to come out of the bushes, didn't. I was met instead with an eerie silence. I turned around, told myself I'd just had a bit too much to drink, and kept walking. Five minutes later, I heard footsteps behind me. They were keeping pace with my own. This time I darted around and yelled, The joke's gone on long enough, come out now. Again, where I expected to see or hear my friends, I was met with an eerie silence. I turned and picked up the pace, then immediately heard the footsteps, still keeping pace with my own. I stopped dead in my tracks, and so did the footsteps. And then, I ran as fast as I could. And again, the footsteps kept pace, only this time they were getting closer and closer to me instead of keeping the same distance like they had before. My heart was racing, and I finally saw the bridge to the brook and ran across. Then the footsteps stopped, but I didn't. I ran all the way home. When I got home, my mother was sitting by the fire. I sat down next to her out of breath and shaking, and she asked me what happened. I told her, and she replied, You're lucky you got to the brook. Ghosts can't cross water. The ghost never even crossed my mind until she said that. I even asked my friends at school the next day if it was them and said, You really had me going. But I was met with puzzled faces. Later I found out the last three of the group didn't even leave until closing, almost an hour after I started out home. It may not have been a ghost, but what's scarier is truly not knowing what it was at all. The Original Hellfire Club My encounter at the Hellfire Club, an infamous ruin on the summit of Montpelier Hill in Ireland, is an experience that still haunts my thoughts. The Hellfire Club, originally built as a hunting lodge in the early 18th century, has a reputation for being a place of supernatural occurrences and dark history, including stories of so-called satanic rituals and unexplained phenomena. I was visiting Ireland last autumn, drawn by the rich history and folklore. A local I met in a Dublin pub told me about the Hellfire Club, piquing my interest with tales of ghost sightings and strange happenings. As someone fascinated by the paranormal, I decided to visit the site. I arrived at the ruins on a chilly, overcast afternoon. The remains of the building stood stark against the grey sky, its empty windows like dark, watching eyes. The air was thick with a sense of foreboding, and the wind seemed to carry distant whispers. As I explored the ruins, I felt an increasing sense of unease. The wind grew stronger, and the whispers became more distinct. It was as though multiple voices were speaking in a language I didn't understand. I tried to dismiss it as my imagination, fueled by the stories I had heard. But then, in the main gathering room, where the Hellfire Club once held their meetings, I saw something that stopped me in my tracks. A shadowy figure, cloaked and hooded, stood by the fireplace. It was so clear and defined that I thought it was another visitor. But when I called out, the figure slowly turned toward me, its face obscured by the hood. And then the figure began to fade, dissolving into the air until it was gone. The whispers fell silent. I stood there trying to process what I had just seen. A bit shaken, I quickly left the ruins. The way back felt longer than the hike up, every sound making me jump. Back in Dublin, I did some research on the Hellfire Club. 
The stories ranged from the mundane to the bizarre. Tales of wild parties, occult practices, even murder. Some believe the club's activities invited something dark into the building, and some think that that presence lingers to this day. I don't really know what to make of my experience at the Hellfire Club. Whether it was a ghost or a trick of the light or something else, I can't really say for sure. But the memory of that cloaked figure is something that I will never forget. I don't know what I saw in Northern Ireland by user Jukes for Spooks, posted to r slash paranormal. In 2017, I was in Northern Ireland for a college field trip. My religious studies class was visiting stone circles throughout Northern Ireland and Ireland to focus on religious geography. On this particular day, I think we were visiting the Bagmore stone circles it was a normal, cloudy day, and we were enjoying learning the history of the Bronze Age wonder, excitedly waiting to go back to the hotel to begin a new day of pub hopping. I remember the stone circles being separated from the nearby woods with a small wire fence. For some reason, we were hanging around the fence, peering at the woods that lay not 20 yards away. We had yet to go into any woods during our trip, staying mainly at the sites surrounded by farmland. I remember wanting very much to go into this old wood for whatever reason. We all seemed to feel curious about it. I decided to climb over the small farm wire fence and see if there was anything interesting in the woods. Now, these woods were different than the woods I was used to in North America. The branches were thick, too thick to stand in, I had to bend at the waist to traverse them. The ground was covered in a soft, light brown moss, broken up by tree roots. I remember quickly moving under the branches, staring at the ground so as not to trip. I felt giddy, like I was a child going somewhere my parents told me not to. I felt light, and I began to pick up speed. I suddenly looked up to make sure I wasn't about to run into a tree trunk, when something made me stop in my tracks. I saw legs, human legs. I could only see their legs, like someone was standing straight up in the trees. The branches were too thick to stand in, but this person's legs were the only thing visible. I felt an almost animalistic response of fear that didn't really make sense. I told myself they couldn't see me because I couldn't see their face but for some reason I felt that they knew I was there. Why would someone be out here just standing? We were the only group at the circles and there were no houses nearby. I looked behind me and realized I was much farther into the woods than I had thought. I could barely see the light from the place I entered. It was so quiet that they had to have heard me approach. My only thought was, I'm closer to them than I am to the entrance. They could get me before I make it out. I was only standing there, bent over for no more than a minute, but it felt like forever. I didn't see them move, but I could tell that they were facing toward me, not away. I now really felt like I was somewhere I wasn't supposed to be. Only this time, instead of giddy, I felt nauseated. It was like I was a deer, and they were a hunter. I turned and bolted. I flew through those trees, still bent to avoid collision. I didn't look down this time, stumbling as fast as I could, just focused on the light at the end of the trees. I felt branches pull my hair and clothes as I ran. I couldn't hear anything over my own breathing. As soon as I broke the tree line, I felt a weight lift. The group standing at the fence looked startled by me bursting out of the woods. I told them that I thought I saw someone, but it almost felt wrong to talk about it. We left soon after, and I don't know what I think it was. Was it just a person hanging out deep in the forest? 
Was it a fae? A spirit? The green man? I don't really know. All I know is that it felt like I had come close to something from somewhere else. The Shadow of Charles Fort My paranormal encounter at Charles Fort in Kinsale, Ireland remains one of the most inexplicable experiences of my life. Charles Fort, a 17th century star-shaped fort, is not only an architectural marvel, but also a site steeped in history and, as I came to find out, ghostly tales. I was traveling through Ireland and visiting the famous historical sites of this particular region was on my list. I've always had a keen interest in history, and the opportunity to explore a fort as old and storied as Charles Fort was something I couldn't pass up. I joined a guided tour one afternoon. The weather was slightly overcast, typical of an Irish day, adding to the fort's somber ambiance. As the tour progressed, our guide told us about stories of the fort's past, including tales of battles and sieges. He also mentioned, almost in passing, the legend of the White Lady of Kinsale, a ghost said to haunt the fort. According to the story, she was the daughter of the fort's commander, who fell to her death on her wedding night after witnessing her husband, a soldier at the fort, being shot. The tour concluded without incident, but I decided to linger a bit longer, captivated by the fort's sprawling structure and the breathtaking view of the ocean. As I walked along the ramparts, the atmosphere around me felt increasingly heavy and a sense of unease began to creep over me. That's when I saw her. Standing at the edge of the ramparts was a figure in a white dress, her back to me. Assuming at first that she was another tourist, I called out, asking if she was okay. She didn't respond or move. As I approached, a cold wind swept over me and a feeling of profound sadness engulfed me. I was mere steps away when she suddenly turned. Her face was pale, her eyes empty and sorrowful, and she seemed to look right through me. My heart raced and a chill ran down my spine. I blinked and in that instant she vanished. No trace of her remained, and the heavy atmosphere lifted as abruptly as it had appeared. I stood there for a moment, trying to make sense of what had just happened. I hurried back to the visitor center, my mind racing with questions. I asked one of the staff about the white lady, and their response made my blood run cold. They said that sightings of the white lady were not uncommon, and that many believed she still wandered the fort, mourning her lost love. The experience left me shaken. I've always been open-minded about the paranormal, but encountering it firsthand was something entirely different. The encounter at Charles Fort has stayed with me, and since then I've read more about the fort and its ghostly inhabitant, delving deeper into the legends that surround it. But no matter how much I learn, I can't seem to detach from that sorrowful figure standing at the edge of the world, and I have a feeling that she will always be with me. There was an old stone mill where I lived. It takes a while to walk to the mill, and on a number of occasions in my life, I would enjoy walking there. A lot of weird things happened, and this is one of those times. Basically, I live in a town that used to be the capital of Ireland during the medieval ages. The town has a castle in the center and a canal that runs along one side that in turn leads to the mill in question. I only say this because it's important later on. One day, two of my friends and I decided to go for a walk down to the mill to see if anything would happen. Ten minutes into our long journey, and it started. A groaning. 
It was the oddest thing. It was so loud that I thought it was one of the other lads, but it really wasn't. It just sounded so fake. Literally sounded like anyone pretending to be a zombie. I mean, it was so fake sounding I genuinely wasn't even scared. The canal was to our left and the wall of the castle to our right. The castle is closed at night and security patrols the castle grounds. I genuinely just thought that someone was in the castle grounds on the opposite side of the wall and was just trying to freak us out. It didn't work though, I thought. It was so random at the start. One of the guys was getting some sort of panic attack. He claimed he had a dream the night before about a girl dressed in white roaming around his house and that she had caused his grandfather to pass away. He was convinced the dream was connected to what was happening, but we continued on anyway. The groaning continued the entire way until we reached the halfway point of our journey to the mill. The halfway point is just a car park. The trees open up to reveal the sky. It's one of the only places during this walk where trees aren't covering your head. At this point, one of the lads wanted to have a cigarette, so we stopped. And then, it happened. I don't really know how to explain this, but it's almost like there was a flash of black over the sky. Even though it was dark, it was like in a split second, the sky just flashed black. Blink and you'll miss it, but we didn't miss it. Right after this, the groaning got so loud, like it was all around us, but there was nothing there yet. Yet the sounds were so loud and so real. The friend who'd had the panic attack let out a noise of pain. And then, everything stopped. No groaning, no rushing water from the canal, no nature. Just him groaning in pain. He begged us to look at his back because it was burning. And sure enough, he had three scratches the length of his back, from the base of his neck all the way down to his lower back. We used the road that leads to the car park to get out of there. I never really knew how to explain this, as some people just claim it's all explainable, but honestly, to this day, I've never seen the sky flash black like that. I've never heard groaning like that, especially when there's nothing and nobody around to do it. A few weeks later, a friend of mine, Scott, told us of an old legend of a headless horseman who would ride up and down the canal looking for his head. Apparently, the groaning is his decapitated head. I guess it was just lucky for us that we didn't meet the rest of him. My grandmother is one of those people who seems to just be naturally susceptible to paranormal activity. She's in her late 70s and has numerous stories about all sorts of spooky and unexplainable encounters she's had throughout her life. She used to keep me entertained for hours with me getting her to constantly tell and retell her stories again and again. It's the way she tells them, I think, that really invokes a sense of fear. Hopefully, I can do her justice with my recounts as she's not quite up to speed on Reddit. The house she grew up in throughout the 50s was haunted undoubtedly. We'll start with the time that she was walking home from school as a 10-year-old girl. She grew up in Belfast, Northern Ireland in a typical city-style terraced house, maybe 50 houses joined together on a long, narrow street. There was no one immediately around her as she walked home from school one brisk January afternoon, except for one gentleman walking maybe 20 yards in front of her. He was wearing a long black overcoat with a bowler hat, not something that would raise any eyebrows at the time. Suddenly, my grandmother noticed the man stop in front of her house, open the little gate at the front of the small garden, walk the five yards down the path to her front door, open it, and enter the house. Still, she thought nothing of this, simply assuming the man was a friend of her parents, or a colleague of her father's of some kind. Oddly, however, when she got to the front door and went to open it not moments after the man, the door was locked. She thought this strange, as the man had just pushed it open and walked in. Not too weird though, right? Someone may have just locked the door behind him. What was strange, however, was that upon entering the house not 45 seconds after the man in black did, she found herself to be the only one in the house. No parents, 
No man in black. Nobody. My grandmother often speaks of the noises she used to hear lying in her bed at night. And by noises, I mean a horrible, blood-curdling wheeze. Coming from, of all places, directly under her bed. She described it as the long, drawn-out breaths that you would imagine coming from a 90-year-old, 40-a-day smoker on their deathbed. This would happen night after night after night. She used to run downstairs to tell her mother about the man under her bed. But her mother was a stern Christian woman and would have nothing to do with it, often scolding her and sending her back to bed for telling the devil's tales. She explains how she used to just cover her head with blankets and pray for the wheeze to stop, crying herself to sleep most nights. The last story that I'll mention for now again takes place in the same house. My great-grandfather was a policeman and often worked in a regular shift pattern. The house had a small hallway upon entering the front door, around five by five foot, just large enough for a coat rack and the stairs to begin. Immediately to your right when entering the front door was the living room. Most evenings after dinner, my grandmother would sit in the living room and listen to the radio with her sister while her mother knitted or sewed. Rather regularly, they would hear the front door unlock, open and close, the hall light switch flick on, and the rustle and knock of a coat being removed and thrown on the coat rack. My great-grandmother would say, Oh, that must be your father home, or something of the sort, before going to greet him in the hallway. On numerous occasions, though, they wouldn't be able to find him immediately and they would assume that he'd gone upstairs. They would go upstairs to welcome him home, but to no avail. There would also be no coat on the rack. And then, 15 or 20 minutes later, her father would arrive home. It just so happens that my grandmother found out years after moving out of that house that a single man had lived there alone for years and died in the very room that she slept in as a child. Apparently, he had some kind of respiratory condition. I'll never attempt an EVP again, by user Murphy Brock, posted to r slash paranormal. I lived in a haunted house in Ireland. It was the house I grew up in, and it was left to me in a trust. At some point, the trust turned the house over to me. However, in the expanse of time between my stepmother's death and the age of the trust at which point it could be given to me, the acting trustee left the house and property under my care, even stating that I could live there expense-free. It was a late 50s Newport-style home, with 14 acres atop a scenic hill. I had dreamed for almost my entire adult life of retiring and being home again. I made the decision not to move in after tending to the house and property for the first three months. When I reached the age of taking possession in full from the trustee three years later, I sold it within five weeks. Whatever goodness and light had existed within those walls, and it did, from the age of two to 26, had changed into an oppressive and dark creep show off the Richter scale. What I witnessed and felt during my three and a half year oversight is too deep to place into a written narrative but I'll give you the proverbial icing on the cake. Two weeks prior to closing, my wife and the realtor that was handling the approaching closing were in the kitchen talking. I was standing in the living room. I had been fascinated with EVPs for decades, but I'd never attempted one. I took out my cell and clicked memo and started asking questions for about three minutes. I heard nothing. But for the last 40 seconds, I was silent, but I could see the voice graph moving as if noises were being registered. Before I could do a playback, my wife walked in and asked if I was ready to go. I clicked off and left. I didn't listen to what had been recorded until the evening after I sold the house, the closing. My delay wasn't deliberate. I had just forgotten about doing it. So I listened. 
While listening, I saw why the noise graph had been bouncing around for that initial 40 seconds. There were voices, two voices, talking, one not specifically addressing my questions, and the other addressing them. I played the recording for five people, one close friend and four family members. All of them heard what I had captured, but no one knew what to say, and neither did I. I'm ending this with two declarative statements. I will never attempt an EVP again, and I'm glad I sold my family home. I lived in a haunted house in Ireland by user John Von one posted to r slash paranormal. Make of this what he will. Back in 2009, Ireland was going through the recession, but I managed to buy a house. It was a nice little cottage. It suited me perfectly as I was a single man. I did shift work, so it was nights and days, days and nights. Initially, I thought it was because I wasn't getting enough sleep, but things started to happen within the house that I couldn't explain. For instance, one night I was doing some ironing. I put a towel on the railing in the bathroom and went back into the kitchen to get some more clothes to hang and put away. I came back up and the towel that I had put on the bathroom railing was strewn across my bedroom floor. My first thought was that there was someone in the house with me. So I ran back into the kitchen and grabbed the frying pan. It was a small house, so there was nowhere for someone to hide. After a while, I reasoned that it couldn't have been an intruder because the door was locked and all the windows were shut. It scared the life out of me, but I convinced myself that I wasn't paying attention and that I might have actually left the towel in my room even though I knew I didn't. But things only got worse as time went on and couldn't be dismissed so easily. It got to the stage where I was actually afraid of being in my own home. For instance, coming in from work, particularly at nighttime, there was a light switch on the wall by the doorway. I'd have to switch that one on before I would even open the door fully. I was so terrified that I wouldn't even look into the darkness. Sometimes when I'd open the door at nighttime, there'd be a gust of wind coming out from the house to greet me. But it eventually got to the stage where I was beginning to wonder if I was losing my mind. This went on for months, things going missing, curtains being closed when I left a room and being partially open when I came back in minutes later. The final straw was when I actually saw something. I arrived home one night at about 3 a.m. after being at work. I opened the hall door and switched on the light. Just to give you a picture of the layout of the house, it was quite small. There was a hallway and down the end of the hallway was a doorway to a bathroom that was out the back and the kitchen was to the left. So this night in particular, I switched on the light and opened the door fully to be greeted by all I can say was a big man's shadow, and this thing was standing at the end of the hallway. Now, how it was a shadow is beyond me, because there were three spotlights running down the hall and they lit up everywhere. But this shadow stood within the light and it was facing me. Every hair on my body stood on edge. The fright and the fear and the panic was so intense I roared out, leave me alone, just leave me alone. And with that, whatever it was, it turned sideways and I could see the whole profile of his face. Then there was a massive bang and a chair was sent flying up the hallway toward me. I legged it out of the house, got back into my car and traveled back up to my parents' house. I was so distraught. I had a brother living in our parents' house at the time and he thought I'd been in some kind of an accident. I tried to explain it to them the best that I could what had happened, 
I hadn't said anything to anyone about the goings-on in the house up until that point, and I'd been living in it for about six months, and it had been going on that whole time. Almost every day something happened. Being terrified in your own home is a horrible feeling. My brother and I drove back down to the house the following day, and we found the chair that had been thrown at me in the hallway on top of the kitchen table. I had a bottle of water in the fridge, and I took it out and placed it on the kitchen table. As my brother and I were talking, the bottle just burst. It was as if somebody had shaken a Coke can and opened it and then it just went everywhere. Every surface of the kitchen seemed to have water on it. I sold the house about six months later. During the months between putting the house up for sale and eventually selling it, strange things continued to happen within the house, like things going missing and curtains being moved. Thankfully though, I never saw the apparition again. One night, I was lying in bed. It was about 1 a.m. And coming from the back of the house, I heard a woman's voice say, no doctor, please help me. Petrified, I leapt out of bed and turned on all the lights. I searched everywhere, checked that the door was locked. It was, and the windows were all shut. The television was plugged out because it sometimes turned on by itself. Same for the radio, which was also unplugged. I'll never forget the sadness in her voice and the way she said it. It wasn't, no doctor, please help me. It was, no doctor, please help me. Like for some reason, she didn't want me to bring a doctor. I was so glad to be out of that house when I finally sold it. When I was living there, I had asked a neighbor and he told me that the couple who had bought the house off, the wife had been complaining about hearing things in the house. I don't know what I saw or heard, but I do know that whatever it was, it was definitely something that was within the house because I haven't experienced anything like that since then. I don't know whether the couple who bought the house off me experienced anything, I couldn't say. After all these years, I still don't talk about this with people as I don't want them thinking that I'm crazy, but I know that this happened to me. This happened early, around five or six in the morning, and I was fast asleep. I was about 10 years of age. So I was sleeping and gradually woke up in a nice, relaxing way. I didn't jump up or startle or anything like that. I rolled over to face the wall. I always go to sleep in this position. And as I rolled over, there was a man dressed in all white with a white glow around him. In his hands, he had rosary beads, and he was praying with his head bent down toward the ground. At this point, I was literally frozen solid with fear and stuck in the spot I was in. I pulled the covers up over my head for a split second, and then realized that I could move, and I ran downstairs to my parents' room. I've seen a ghost. There's a ghost in my room, I said. Son, there's not. You've had a nightmare. Go back to bed. I refused to go back to my room. I fell asleep in their bed. A couple of hours later, the house phone rang, probably at around 7 or 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning, which is highly unusual. My dad answered the phone. Hello? What? How? Right, okay, I'm up. I'll be over as soon as I can. Is everything okay? My mom asked. No, my brother Tony has died. I never met my uncle Tony. He lived in England and we live in Ireland. He was only 30 and died peacefully in his sleep. My dad brought some photos to show me who he was and to tell me about him. And that's when I realized this was the man who had been kneeling beside my bed praying. When I was 12, my younger brother and I used to travel up over the border to a small town in Northern Ireland to visit our father, as my parents had divorced. 
My dad, being a firm Protestant, insisted that we rejoin a Protestant scout group called the Boys' Brigade. We had left it a few years prior, due to moving across the county and there being no installation where we had moved. So now that we could attend it again, we were drafted in and off we went. For anyone wondering, it isn't at all like American Scouts. It's like Sunday school, but you sit around and read scripture, learn marching drills, play football, dodgeball, etc., all inside of a massive church hall, and then every so often you'd go on a day trip to different places. This one particular trip had us going off for an overnight weekend stay in some adventure camping compound way up in the forests adjacent to a coastal town. Rock climbing, kayaking, orienteering, etc. But much more controlled and set out. It would be less like wild camping, more like show up to this place, get our own dorm rooms with bunk beds in them, wake up and go have breakfast in the cafeteria, then go do some activities, go get dinner, and finally back to the dorms for the night. So upon getting to my dorm room, I picked the top bunk next to the window, and when it came time to sleep, I was laying on my side, looking out, when I noticed that there was an old tree stump directly ahead of me. The stump was directly ahead in a straight line as you exited the dorm complex, so anybody walking out to go get breakfast in the morning would see it. You couldn't not notice it, as it was just there. So the next morning I woke up late and everyone else was already walking down to get breakfast. So I pulled my clothes on and ran down to catch up. As I exited the main doors, I saw a woman in a white dress sitting on the tree stump, just combing her hair. Now this woman had bare feet and she didn't look like she belonged there. Remember this compound was completely empty bar us scout boys and our brigade leaders. So seeing any type of person there would raise some alarm bells. But the fact that it was a woman in a clean white dress with bare feet in the middle of a compound in a forest just combing her hair was unnatural. I rubbed my eyes as I knew that I was seeing things, but nope, still there. So I did what any scared boy would do. I ran the hell out of there back up to my dorm room and nervously looked out the window to see that she was now gone. I waited until a brigade leader came up to tell me to get out to breakfast and I told him what I saw. He didn't buy it for a second and ushered me out the door. The next day we went home, but it has stuck with me all these years. Supernatural or not, it wasn't normal, and it still gives me shivers thinking about it. There was no rhyme or reason, even if it was just a normal woman, to be there. But, in hindsight, given our local lore and culture, I sometimes wonder if I saw a banshee. I grew up in Ireland, and back in the 90s, my family had a small holiday home in Ballyornan that we shared with a bunch of relatives. The house has long since been sold, but there were a couple of freaky things that happened to me. The house was located in a small, isolated area with a bunch of other holiday homes and families. The entrance had a farmer's field attached where people would always pat and feed the white horse that was always there. Polo mints were his favorite. One year, when I was around six or seven, my younger cousin and I crawled through an opening in a barbed wire fence that we used to do regularly to go pat the horse close up. This was also in the middle of the day, so it was completely bright. We were feeding and patting the horse when I noticed along the top of the field a person running across. But something was strange, markedly that they seemed to be completely translucent. They stopped dead in their tracks and turned to face us, about 50 yards away. At this point, the horse started kicking and neighing and became extremely unsettled. It ran off to the other end of the field. We turned around and this person was still coming at us. We could see a face and I remember it being completely sinister looking, with a smile. My cousin and I absolutely bolted back through the barbed wire fence and ran straight home. We didn't mention it to any of the adults because we shouldn't have been entering the private property in the first place. So we had a few sleepless nights, but we let it lie. In my adult life, I had recounted this story to a few friends, but sort of at the time I was still convinced myself that I had fabricated it and maybe it was nothing. 
until I ran into my cousin at a New Year's party a few years back. We hadn't spoken for some time as he'd been living in America, but over a pint I recalled the story to him, and he absolutely recalled every single detail. This gave me the weirdest chilling feeling I've ever had, mainly because I assumed that we did see something, but that I had most likely fabricated it. But he even recalled this person's face, and the sinister look, the smile, and the translucent appearance. This may not be the creepiest thing you'll ever read about, but it's always been very personal to me, and I often replay it in my head, over and over. I grew up in the countryside, literally in the middle of nowhere in Ireland. The house was originally a small cottage. My parents bought it before I was born, and they renovated it and added an extension. There were five other houses on our country road, the closest being a large field away. I don't know much about the history of our house, the land that it was built on, or the history of the area other than an elderly lady lived in the cottage before my parents bought it, and she passed away in a nursing home. The only info that I have about the area is that it was old, and it was a civil parish. Civil parishes are units of territory in the island of Ireland that have their origins in the old Gaelic territorial divisions. Some other things worth noting before I get into the experiences... Behind our house, across a newly built road, was an old graveyard and the ruins of an old church enclosed in a stone wall. When I say old, I mean the gravestones were tipping over, sinking into the ground, and you couldn't read the writing on them anymore. You could see the graveyard from my window and my brother's window. On top of that, when they built that road, they built it when I was a kid as a new main road into town, Archaeologists discovered signs of an early medieval monastery, the site dating back between the 6th and 9th century. They also found some old signs of medieval settlements, some artifacts like tools and things like that relating to the time period, as well as undated burial activity, that's how they put it. Some scattered human bones and the remains of bones of a boy that they think was probably around 7 years old were also found. In the field right next to our house, there were also the ruins of what looked like a small cluster of old stone houses. And there was something similar further down the road. Whenever we get together as a family, we always end up talking about the house and what we experienced. We moved out six years ago. I don't know who or what it was, but there was definitely more than one ghost or spirit. It seemed like there were a lot. I don't know if it has anything to do with the graveyard or what they found or the house or the land itself. I really don't feel like it was the woman that lived there before us either. My mom, dad, two brothers, myself obviously and friends that stayed over all experienced something or just got a weird vibe. Funny enough, almost everything that happened happened in the new or built on part of the house rather than in the old part and stuff happened outside too. I would often feel like there was someone in my room, and I don't know why, but I felt like it was a man. I would never chill in my room alone, and I would dread nighttime coming to go to sleep. I just felt like somebody was there. I heard what sounded like someone walking around. Not footsteps, but just like the movement of someone. I often felt like I was being watched, inside and outside. Fair enough that it could have just been my imagination, or me freaking myself out as a kid, but on multiple occasions I heard what sounded like children talking and playing, but then nobody would be there. On one occasion I heard what sounded like a choir singing in the direction of the graveyard and church, and on another occasion I heard what sounded like drums being played, like this weird repetitive rhythm, almost like a chant. It's hard to describe. Another time I was outside playing near the side of the house. I was kneeling down and it was as if somebody had thrown a small stone or pebble, not at me, but in my direction from behind. We had stone clippings in our garden, so I figured it was that. I heard the stone land as if somebody had thrown it, and it happened three times within like 20 seconds of each other. 
I turned around to see who might want my attention, but nobody was there. Another time, I went to bed really early when it was still bright out. I remember this so vividly, I can even remember the duvet cover that I had on. So I was laying down, wide awake, and it felt as if somebody poked me pretty hard. It was like a strong index finger poking in my lower back. I kind of froze, felt freaked out, didn't turn around and just convinced myself that it was the paw of one of my teddy bears. I didn't think about it again until years later. From the living room window, my brother saw a man in a hat smoking a cigarette, standing outside leaning against the wall near the front door. He got up like, who the hell is that? Went outside, but nobody was anywhere near us and he didn't hear anybody run away. You could hear people move even the slightest bit on the stone chippings. Which brings me to my next point. A couple of times, my mom heard someone knock on the back door, but when we went to answer it, nobody was there. She never heard them walk or run away. Another time, she saw the silhouette of someone, again smoking, through the window of the back door, as if they were standing just outside the door. As usual though, nobody was there. On a couple of occasions, she felt as though somebody was sitting in the back of the car with her when she left our house to go to the shop in the late evenings. The feeling was so strong that she would keep looking in the mirror. A couple of times she even stopped the car and looked under the seats just to make sure nobody was there. My dad, who was a full-on skeptic, saw a black shadow down the end of the hall go from one side to the other. My brother felt like somebody had touched his foot in bed and on a couple of occasions heard what sounded like somebody walking down the hallway and stopping outside his door, as though they were going to come in, but hesitated. He would call out to see who it was, but nobody ever answered, so it wasn't any of us. He would also see the hallway lights being turned on and off, and when he was outside around the back garden, he would get this sudden urge or feeling like he should go inside and he would run in like there was imminent danger. This is weird because I used to feel that way too. Our dog stared and barked at nothing a few times and a friend of mine that stayed over hated when she had to wake up to use the bathroom in the middle of the night because she said she felt like somebody was watching her from the end of the hallway. I would love to hear any of your thoughts as to what might have been going on in my house. I've been wanting to tell this story for a while. I have always been open-minded about the supernatural, and I enjoy a good ghost story as much as the next person. The following is an account of something that I experienced a little over 20 years ago in County Dublin in the Republic of Ireland. I've had very little experience with what could be called supernatural phenomena, but this one has stayed with me and left me wondering about what I experienced. The girl that I was seeing at the time gave me a call to let me know that her parents would be out of town for the weekend and that I was more than welcome to spend the weekend alone with her in her parents' house. Now, being a teenage boy, I naturally didn't need to be asked twice and before I knew it, we were cuddling away in her bedroom. It wasn't long, however, until our passion was interrupted by the distinct sound of footsteps coming up the stairs. On hearing the footsteps, I immediately leapt up and said something along the lines of, What the fuck? I thought your parents were gone for the weekend. She assured me that they were indeed gone for the weekend, and seemed to brush off the fact that we had both clearly heard heavy footsteps coming up the stairs. Strange things continued to happen throughout the day, such as once when walking by a room to get to the bathroom. I couldn't help but notice that all the windows had been opened and that the curtains were blowing around like they were in a hurricane. The thing is, I could have sworn that those windows had been shut the first time I passed them, but who knows, maybe I was mistaken. In fact, I wasn't really feeling spooked by any of this, and I just told myself that what I'd witnessed could have been the result of any number of things. It wasn't long until I actually was freaked out though. At some time in the middle of the night, both myself and my girlfriend woke up and I remember asking what the hell was going on. I had a feeling that I can't quite describe, sort of a mixture of dread and despair, 
with a hint of curiosity, if that makes any sense. I could hear movement downstairs, and I had the distinct feeling that there was a crowd of God knows what below in the kitchen. I could also hear conversations, but I couldn't make out what was being said. I again asked my girlfriend what was going on in this house, and to my surprise, she calmly said, Oh, this kind of thing is always happening. This didn't exactly reassure me, but I managed to get back to sleep without any further incident. Now, one more thing I'd like to add is that the house in question was a terraced house, and the house next door had not been too long before the scene of a murder. From what I remember in the news, a woman had been pretty brutally killed, but no one had ever been convicted. Everybody was convinced that it was the husband, but I think he got off on a technicality. I've always wondered if this had anything to do with some of the strange things I experienced there. I've had over a week to think about this, and I can't come up with a satisfactory, rational explanation. I live on the north coast of Northern Ireland, not far from the Giant's Causeway, just to give some reference people might know. Just over a week ago, I was sitting watching television with my wife. I sit by one of the windows sometimes because there's a plug there for my laptop. My wife was sitting on the other sofa, so she couldn't see out of this particular window. It was around 8.30, and it was perfectly dark outside. If I looked out, I could see the lights of our local town, Ballymoney. It's tiny, more of a village, really. Just to set the scene, we're about three miles out, surrounded by farmland. Anyway, I'm watching TV and occasionally glancing out the window, when all of a sudden I see this bright light just over the fields. It was multicolored, and it kind of blooms and grows larger. At first I thought it was a firework, which would have been bizarre enough late in March in the middle of the pandemic lockdown. Except that it's too slow, if that makes sense. It brightened into maybe three different colors. It was hard to judge distances in the dark, but if I had to guess, I would say it was two acres or more away, and larger than a family car, hanging maybe... 80 to 100 feet up, pretty low. Eventually it faded and disappeared, again not behaving anything like a firework, and far too large to be a flare. I said at the time that I thought I had seen somebody letting off fireworks. A few minutes later I glanced out again and there's a smaller light roving around in the same spot, but it vanished almost the moment that I looked at it. This light was maybe a third the size of the original, and was moving left to right. I've thought about it ever since. The annual Ballymoney Town firework display is much farther away, and we can always hear it from home. Yet this was soundless. Helicopters and drones don't have lights like that. And again, if there had been a chopper out there so low and so close, we would have heard it. A drone still strikes me as the most likely, we wouldn't have heard it inside the house, and I guess it might have been rigged with really powerful lights, but they would have had to have been incredibly powerful, so I don't know, and the size still throws me off. I've never, ever seen or heard a drone over that area in the daytime, and I'm out there all the time. Honestly, I think I might have seen a UFO. No lights in the sky were reported in local news or on social media, though, and I haven't seen anything since. This happened outside of Hillsboro, Illinois. The story takes place in 2010. When I was in high school, I worked at the movie theater in town. It was an awesome first job. Free popcorn, soda, candy, and I got to watch movies whenever I wanted. The owners would even let me bring friends in after hours to watch movies or play games on the big screen. It was pretty normal for my friends to drive around town, randomly stop by the theater when they knew I was working and just chat. Not much else to do in a small town. 
Two of my friends, Taylor, nicknamed Tej, and Justin, stopped by and hung out in the lobby with me while we waited for the movie to end. Tej told me that he heard a rumor of some weird lights out at an old cemetery just outside of town. Tej was a pathological liar, so I doubted almost everything that came out of his mouth. Justin started backing up what Tej was saying, so I told them that as soon as I finished cleaning up the theater, I would close up and drive out to the cemetery with them. The late show finished, I cleaned the theater, and I locked up at about one in the morning. I honestly had no idea what to expect, so I told them that I would drive. At the time, I drove my dad's F-150 Ford pickup truck. So the three of us squeezed into the front seat and they directed me out to the cemetery. I thought for sure they were messing with me, but after about 20 minutes of driving on old country roads, we came up to a bridge, which was at the bottom of a hill. The bridge was surrounded by woods and the cemetery was at the top of the hill. The bridge looked super old and I wasn't sure if it would hold the weight of the truck. So I parked the truck right in front of the bridge. Tiege told me to turn the truck off and said he was getting out. At this point, I didn't really trust Tiege and I was also freaked out because we were at a cemetery at two in the morning. So I told them that I was staying in the truck. They caved and stayed in the truck with me. About five or so minutes passed and we started to see fireflies. It was so dark and clear out that we could see them even in the woods around us. I asked Tiege if those were the lights he saw, but before he could answer, he pointed up at the top of the hill and I saw a giant blue light. Once I looked at this blue light at the top of the hill, several others popped up in the woods around us and then more up in the actual cemetery. The lights looked like they were blinking, but this could have also been for moving around in the woods where trees were blocking their light. I started freaking out and I was screaming at both of them and said that if they were playing some kind of prank, it wasn't funny and I was leaving. I tried to turn the truck back on, but it turned once and then died. Tiej had a shocked look on his face which only made me more anxious. At this point, I was crying, borderline hysterical, and I kept pumping the gas when turning the key. I didn't look up. I didn't want to. Finally, after what felt like forever, the truck started. I looked up then and saw that blue light at the top of the hill was now in the middle of the bridge and it had taken the shape of a torso. At this point, I had no clue what was happening, but I just had a really bad feeling and I knew that I needed to get out of there. Tiege was yelling at me to stay there, that he wanted to see this thing, that he wanted to see this thing to get closer, but I wasn't listening. I was shaking as I threw the truck into reverse and sped back the way we'd come. We were quiet the whole way back to the theater. I dropped Tiege and Justin off at their car and drove home. I sat up in bed on the computer, searching to see if I could find any explanation as to what I saw. Angels? Demons? Spirit orbs? Aliens? I had no idea. It all seemed like BS to me, honestly, but I still couldn't logically explain what I saw. The following morning, I went to Brittany's house. Brittany was my best friend at the time, and I knew she would believe me. As soon as I told her about the story, she asked me to drive her to the cemetery, so I did. We parked in front of the bridge and walked up the hill and then around the cemetery. We looked for LED lights on the tombstones, flashlights, even footprints around the muddy woods, but we didn't see anything that could explain what I had seen the night before. The cemetery was also too far away from any major road for it to have been car headlights. I still don't know what we saw that night, but I get goosebumps every single time I think about it. If anything, it's helped me to keep an open mind about the weird stuff that happens in the world. And maybe that lesson was worth it.
I'm currently seeking some insight into a strange event that happened in my past. I'm hoping for possible explanations related to cryptids or paranormal phenomena, so I can understand what happened. This occurred back when I was living in Seymour, Indiana, when I was about eight or nine years old. I was spending my day at a playground located near the apartment complex where I lived. In my playtime, I distinctly heard my mom's voice calling out to me from a direction entirely opposite to where she was at the moment. Baffled, I went to confirm that it was her, only to be told that she had not called me. I went back to playing and I didn't hear the voice again. What puzzles me are actually a few aspects of this experience. First, my mom was situated a substantial distance away from me, probably about four or five minutes away. Yet the voice that mimicked hers seemed to come from an identical distance, but in the complete opposite direction. Secondly, I have no prior history of hallucinations in my life. I initially shared this story before, but I got more questions than answers. Hopefully somebody knows what this might be. Skinwalker doesn't seem to fit the description, at least based on what I understand, but some kind of mimicry was at play. The Pacific Northwest is known for its lush landscapes, dense forests, and misty coastlines. But on one of my solo road trips through Washington State, I encountered something far more mysterious than the usual scenic vistas. I was driving along a coastal route, the ocean waves crashing against the cliffs to my right. As the afternoon sun began its descent, I approached a long suspension bridge named Elysian Crossing. I hadn't seen it on any map, but it seemed like a shortcut to the next town. As I began my ascent onto the bridge, a dense fog enveloped the area, reducing visibility to just a few meters. But halfway across, the fog cleared suddenly, revealing a breathtaking sight. A sprawling city on the horizon, its skyline unlike any I'd ever seen, Towering spires shimmered with golden light, and intricate buildings seemed to float above the water. Entranced, I continued driving, eager to explore this mysterious city. But as I reached the end of the bridge, a disorienting sensation washed over me. The city vanished, and I found myself back at the entrance of Elysian Crossing, the bridge stretching out before me once again. Confused, I pulled over at a nearby diner. The place was quaint, with a few locals sipping coffee at the counter. I asked the waitress about the bridge and the city I had seen. Her face turned pale. Oh, so you've seen the Mirage City, she whispered. She beckoned an older man, introduced as Mr. Lee, to join us. He began, Elysian Crossing has been here for as long as anyone can remember and so have the tales of Mirage City. It's said to be a reflection of a city from another time, or perhaps another dimension. Those who see it are said to be chosen. Chosen for what? I asked. Mr. Lee shrugged. Some say it's a blessing, a glimpse into a utopian future. Others believe it's a warning, a reminder of the transients of our existence, but no one really knows. All that's certain is that you can't reach the city. Many have tried, only to find themselves back at the start of the bridge. I left the diner with more questions than answers. That night, I camped nearby, the silhouette of the Elysian Crossing visible from my tent. I dreamt of the Mirage City, its streets filled with people from different eras, all coexisting harmoniously. The next morning, I attempted to cross the bridge again, but the city didn't appear. It seemed my glimpse of the Mirage City was a once in a lifetime experience. I continued my journey through the Pacific Northwest, but the memory of the bridge and the city stayed with me. Whether it was a vision of a possible future or a mere trick of the light, the Elysian Crossing and its Mirage City 
served as a reminder of the mysteries that exist just beyond the veil of our understanding. My eyes were already heavy, the dashboard clock flashing 2.37 a.m. as my car cruised along the near-empty Arizona highway. I had been driving from Tucson to Sedona for a long overdue solo retreat. The road was a dark ribbon flanked by towering saguaros and jagged hills. The only light coming from my headlights and the occasional star that peeked through the cloudy sky. I was reaching for my thermos of coffee when it happened. The radio, which had been playing a soft country tune, suddenly erupted into static. Annoyed, I fumbled with the dials, trying to find another station, but to no avail. And that's when I saw her, a woman in white, on the side of the road. Startled, I stepped on the brake. In the split second that it took to slow down, my rational mind kicked in. What would a woman be doing out here in the middle of nowhere, especially at this hour? My foot almost hit the gas pedal to keep going, but something made me stop. She was young, maybe in her early 20s, her white dress glowing in the dark. Her dark hair covered her face, obscuring it from view. As I pulled over, my gut tightened. This was against my better judgment, but what if she was in trouble? I rolled down the passenger side window a couple of inches. Hey, do you need help? I called out. The woman looked up, her face now visible, and what I saw made my heart skip a beat. Her eyes were completely black, no whites or irises, just a void of darkness. Can you give me a ride? Her voice was a whisper, but it echoed in my car as if she were sitting right next to me. Every fiber of my being screamed to drive off. Yet, I was paralyzed, trapped in her gaze. Then, from the depth of my subconscious, an old Native American proverb my grandmother used to tell me surfaced. Never lock eyes with evil, for it will consume you. Summoning every ounce of willpower, I looked away, my hand gripping the gear shift. As I prepared to accelerate, she let out a wail, a terrible, mournful sound that seemed to reverberate in the air long after it stopped. When I glanced back to where she stood, or where she should have been standing, she was gone, vanished. I floored the gas pedal, my car shooting forward as if jolted by my own adrenaline. The radio blinked back to life, resuming the country song where it had left off as if nothing had happened. I didn't stop until I reached Sedona, and even then I couldn't shake the unsettling feeling that had enveloped me. Later, as I recounted my experience to a local, he nodded gravely. Sounds like La Llorona, he said, referring to the weeping woman, a famous ghostly figure in Hispanic folklore. She's been seen on these roads before. You're lucky you drove away. Whether it was La Llorona or something else entirely, I can't say, but I do know that the experience forever altered my perception of what lies beyond the realm of human understanding. Now, whenever I find myself driving on lonely roads in the dead of night, I can't help but wonder what, or who, might be lurking just beyond the reach of my headlights. The leaves had just started to turn colors, and I found myself driving on a stretch of road in West Milford, New Jersey, known as Clinton Road. My buddy, who was a folklore enthusiast, had filled me in on the tales of the area, 
a notorious 10-mile stretch. It had more legends associated with it than any other road in the US. Stories ranged from ghostly apparitions, strange creatures, to even eerie gatherings of unknown societies. It was near twilight, that perfect hue of orange and purple in the sky, when I started my drive. I remember feeling slightly uneasy as the dense woods on either side of the road appeared to close in on me. As I drove further, the tranquility of the fall season began to be overshadowed by an inexplicable weightiness in the air. In the descending darkness, my headlights caught a glimpse of something by the side of the road, a decrepit looking truck from what seemed like the 60s, parked haphazardly by the side of the road. Being the good Samaritan, I thought I'd stop and check if someone needed any help. I pulled over a few yards ahead and rolled down my window. There was stillness in the air, except for the faint whispering of the wind through the trees. I called out, Hey, anyone there? Need help? To my surprise, a coin suddenly dropped onto the asphalt beside my car. I picked it up and inspected it. It was old and worn out, dated back to 1965. I recalled one of the legends associated with the road, the ghost of a boy who had died under mysterious circumstances, and if you dropped a coin on a certain bridge, he'd throw it back. Was this the bridge? A shiver ran down my spine. Just then, the old truck's headlights blinked to life. Its engine roared and it started moving, backward. The vehicle didn't turn around. Instead, it backed up at an alarming speed, headlights blinding me momentarily. Fumbling for the ignition, I managed to get my car started and I sped away. The old truck seemed to follow for a bit, but its presence faded the farther I got from that spot. Relief washed over me as I saw the sign indicating the end of Clinton Road. But the coin? It sat on my dashboard, a grim reminder that not all legends are mere tales. It took me weeks to muster up the courage to drive by that road again. By daylight, of course. Whenever someone asks me if I believe in ghosts or paranormal activities, I simply show them the coin, a testament to that eerie autumn night on Clinton Road. My wife and I seemed to have a simultaneous glitch a couple of years ago at a hotel in Canada. It's not the most significant or interesting glitch, I guess, but we've never experienced such a thing before or since. We were spending the night at a random hotel in Toronto on an overnight layover before flying to Mexico the next day. We are not from Canada and I had never been to Toronto before. My wife had, but as a teenager and only on a brief trip. When we walked into the lobby to check in, there was a small line of people waiting at the desk. We got in line behind a middle-aged couple who looked like maybe they were there for a wedding or a party. They immediately turned around and smiled at us as if we were all old friends. The wife of the partner said, hey, so are you girls heading back to Winnipeg in the morning? My wife and I faltered for a moment she was obviously talking to us and not anybody else, but we had no idea why. We had never met this couple before, let alone engaged in any kind of conversation with them. We had just gotten to the hotel. Plus, neither of us have ever been to Winnipeg. Uh, no, I replied uncomfortably. The woman looked confused and just said, Oh, she was called up by one of the attendants and we got the other, so there was no way to talk any further. My wife and I just kind of looked at each other and laughed, like how weird. We got our room keys and went over to the elevator. It was a large chain hotel 
and our room was on one of the higher up floors. The elevator stopped before our floor, and when the doors slid open, there were about four to five guys there, late 30s, maybe early 40s, holding beers. They saw us and acted pleasantly surprised. They all did the, hey, kind of surprised cheer, as if they hadn't expected to run into us. My wife and I just figured they were having some fun. But then they started talking to us as if they knew us too. Ah, oh, we're having a party in Dan's room, one of the guys said. Again, my wife and I were unsure if they were actually speaking to us. But there was no one else in the elevator that they would be talking to, so they were. I said, oh, okay. Another guy said, you girls headed up to bed? My wife and I gave each other the side eye. Uh, yep, she said. Yeah, I'm pretty tired too. It's been a long day. The door slid open at what I was guessing was Dan's floor. Well, we'll all be down here in Dan's room if you change your minds. The guys got off the elevator, and when the doors closed, my wife and I started cracking up. What in the world was going on? Why did all these people seem to think they knew us? We made it to our room and got ready for bed. It was chilly, so I slept in my socks, which I almost never do. I fell asleep right away and I slept like a rock as we had already had a long first day of travel to make it to Toronto. When we woke up the next morning, I got out of bed and immediately noticed another weird thing. I was still wearing socks but they weren't the socks I had worn to bed the night before. In fact, they weren't my socks at all. I was immediately grossed out, but my wife and I had a good laugh about it. I mean, how in the world did that happen? I've never been a sleepwalker, not once in my life. So weird. Since we had a flight to catch, we grabbed our stuff and made our way down to the lobby to check out. It was busy and there was another line at the desk. We stood behind this woman who had two suitcases. She was standing with her body half turned toward us, so she saw us coming. She looked up from her phone when we got in line and then went back to minding her own business as we were. Then after a minute, she looked up directly at us and said, did Bob go to get the car or something? What in the world? Again, we had never laid eyes on this woman before this moment. We had no idea who she was, and we certainly didn't know Bob. I have no idea, I said finally. Like the others, she seemed confused by my confusion. It's been a couple of years since this incident at the hotel, but my wife and I still laugh about it from time to time. That hotel was just full of people who were so sure that they knew us, but that's impossible. Our theory is that maybe there was an event at the hotel with guests who looked like us, but I mean, what are the odds of that? And that still wouldn't explain what happened to my socks. To this day, it's still the strangest thing that has ever happened to us. It had been an exhausting day of meetings in Phoenix, and I was more than eager to make the drive back to my home in Flagstaff. The thought of my own bed was the only thing keeping me going as I sped down the empty highway. Arizona's night sky was something to marvel at, endless and filled with stars, a stark contrast to the city lights I'd left behind. I was about halfway through the journey when it happened. A flicker of light in the sky caught my attention. Not unusual, of course. Shooting stars are a common sight in these parts. But then another flicker followed, this time a bit longer, accompanied by two more bursts of light. My curiosity peaked, I pulled over to the side of the road to get a better look. I stepped out of the car, 
the cool desert air filling my lungs as I looked up. At first, there was nothing but the usual celestial panorama, but then I saw them. A series of lights, glowing orbs really, moving in a formation unlike any aircraft I had ever seen. They were perfectly synchronized, darting around in complex patterns that made my head spin. It lasted for maybe a minute, but it felt like an eternity. Then, as quickly as they had appeared, the lights shot upward and vanished, leaving me staring at an empty sky. I stood there, dumbfounded. I'm a rational person, or at least I'd like to think I am. But what I had just witnessed defied any rational explanation. I considered taking out my phone to record the phenomenon, but realized I'd been so awestruck that the thought hadn't even crossed my mind until it was too late. Climbing back into the car, I continued my drive home, my mind racing with questions. Had I just seen UFOs? A secret military operation? Or something else entirely? And why me? Why there, on that empty stretch of Arizona highway? The questions persisted long after I got home and crawled into bed. Sleep was elusive that night, and when it finally came, it was filled with dreams of lights in the sky, darting around in formations that seemed to spell out messages I couldn't quite decipher. In the days that followed, I scoured news reports and social media, looking for any mention of the mysterious lights, but found nothing. It was as if I had been the sole witness to this celestial ballet. That experience changed something in me. Whenever I look up at the night sky now, it's not just stars I see, but possibilities. Countless, endless possibilities that stretch as far as the universe itself. Whether those lights were extraterrestrial in nature or something else entirely, I may never know. But they serve as a constant reminder that the world is filled with mysteries, and sometimes, those mysteries choose to reveal themselves when you least expect it, under a sprawling canopy of an Arizona sky. My work as a geologist often took me to remote corners of Arizona, places where the roads stretch out into the horizon and the desert stretches out even further. A landscape that could be hypnotic in its repetitive beauty. But that day in September, the land felt different somehow, its eerie emptiness weighing heavily on me. I was returning from a soil testing job driving my well-worn pickup down a highway I'd traversed at least a dozen times before. Dusk was falling, casting long shadows on the ground and turning the sky into a canvas of reds and purples. I was listening to a podcast about ancient civilizations, their folklore and myths, which usually fascinated me. But on that drive, the words became a monotonous drone blending into the background as I struggled to keep my focus. Just when my eyes were becoming a little too heavy for comfort, I saw it, a solitary tree standing near the highway. This wouldn't be remarkable in any other circumstance, but this tree was ablaze. Flames leapt from its branches, yet it didn't seem to be burning down. It stood there, a spectacle of fire against the backdrop of the setting sun. I pulled over, grabbed my fire extinguisher, and ran toward it. But as I got closer, I realized something astonishing. There was no heat emanating from the flames. Cautiously, I extended a hand toward the fire and felt nothing but the cool desert air. The flames were cold, or at least not hot. My rational mind grappled with this impossibility. It was then that I heard the whisper, a hushed voice so soft it was almost drowned out by the crackling flames. Help me, it said. 
I looked around, thinking someone must be playing a trick on me, but there was no one. I was alone with this inexplicable burning tree. Who are you? I stammered, feeling ridiculous for talking to a tree, but unable to help myself. I am bound, the voice whispered, more audibly this time. Release me. Without thinking, I pulled out the small hatchet I kept in my toolkit for sample collection. As the blade cut through the bark, the flames flickered, as if reacting to my touch. Finally, with one last swing, I severed a branch. The moment it fell, the flames vanished, leaving the tree as it was, just a tree. I felt a sudden rush of wind and a feeling of liberation washed over me. The tree looked normal, mundane even, but I couldn't shake the sensation that something extraordinary had just occurred. I took the severed branch with me, storing it carefully in the back of my pickup. That night, I did some research and found local Native American legends about spirits being trapped in trees, waiting for someone to release them. Could it be that I had encountered one such spirit? Rational explanations eluded me, but the branch, still untouched by burn marks, was a tangible, physical proof that I clung to. Since then, my views on the paranormal have shifted. I don't know what I released that day or what it meant, but I do know that the desert is a place of mysteries, some better left unsolved, others begging to be explored. Whatever it was, that fiery visage is etched in my memory, a constant reminder that reality is far more complex and wondrous than we can ever fully comprehend. The highway stretched out in front of me, a ribbon of asphalt cutting through the Arizona desert. It was past midnight, and I was the only car in sight. The sky was so clear that the stars looked like pinpricks on a dark curtain, and I felt as though I was driving through space, alone in the universe. It was a peaceful sort of isolation. But then my car started to sputter. Glancing down at the dashboard, I saw the needle on the fuel gauge sink dangerously close to E. I cursed myself for not checking earlier. Just as I began to pull over, my headlights flickered and died. In an instant, I was plunged into darkness, save for the dim illumination provided by the moon and stars. Nervous but determined, I managed to pull my car off to the side of the road. I took out my phone to call for help, but no bars. I was in a dead zone. Great, I muttered, contemplating limited options. That's when I noticed it. A soft, bluish glow in the distance, beyond the road, somewhere amidst the cacti and brush. My first thought was that it was another vehicle, but the light didn't resemble headlights. It was more ethereal pulsating softly, like the light of a firefly, but much brighter. Curiosity overcoming caution, I grabbed a flashlight and stepped out of the car, locking the doors behind me. I began walking toward the light. As I got closer, I realized the glow was emanating from a cluster of rocks arranged in a circle. The rocks themselves seemed to be the source of the light, I reached out to touch one, half expecting to feel heat, but they were cool to the touch. As my fingers made contact, the rocks glowed brighter, and for a moment I felt a strange sensation, like an electric charge running through me. Images flashed in my mind, strange symbols, a night sky different from our own, and faces I couldn't recognize. Just as quickly, the visions were gone. Stunned, I stepped back. The rocks dimmed, returning to their original glow. Shaken, I returned to my car, 
my mind buzzing with questions. When I got back in, I turned the key in the ignition, half expecting it not to work. To my surprise, the car roared back to life, headlights and all. Confused but grateful, I drove away, constantly glancing in my rearview mirror, half expecting to see the glowing rocks follow me. They didn't, but as I looked back one final time, I swear I saw them flash brightly, as if saying goodbye, or perhaps until next time. I don't know what I stumbled upon that night. Some local legends speak of spirit stones, rocks imbued with mystical energies, but what I experienced seemed beyond the realm of any folklore. Those glowing rocks and the visions they triggered have left me both intrigued and humbled, serving as a constant reminder of the mysteries that lie just beyond the boundaries of human understanding, even in the empty stretches of an Arizona highway. The Siren at Giant's Causeway My encounter at Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland was as bewildering as it was chilling a stark contrast to the natural beauty of the place. Known for its unique basalt columns, Giant's Causeway is a popular tourist attraction, steeped in myth and legend. But what I experienced there was far from the tales of giants I had heard. It was a cool, foggy morning when I set out to explore the causeway. The fog was thick, enveloping the landscape in a mysterious veil making the hexagonal columns appear otherworldly. I was captivated by the surreal beauty and the rhythmic sound of the waves crashing against the rocks. As I walked further along the coast, away from the main tourist paths, the fog seemed to grow denser. The sounds of the ocean became more pronounced and I could hear what seemed like a melody intertwined with the waves. It was a hauntingly beautiful song, unlike anything I had ever heard. Drawn by the melody, I found myself moving toward the water's edge. The song grew louder, more enchanting. And that's when I saw her. Through the mist, there was a figure sitting on one of the rocks just off the shore. She was ethereal, her hair long and dark, her skin pale against the dark sea. She seemed to be the source of the captivating song. I stood there, mesmerized by her presence and her voice. It felt as though the song was wrapping around me, pulling me closer to the water. I took a step forward, my mind foggy as if in a trance. Suddenly, a loud wave crashed onto the shore, snapping me out of my daze. I looked again, but the figure was gone. The song had ceased leaving only the natural sounds of the ocean. I felt a chill run down my spine as I realized how close I had been to the water's edge. I hurried back to the main path, glancing over my shoulder, half expecting to see the figure again. But there was only the sea and the fog. Back at my accommodation, I shared my experience with the host. She told me about old sailors' tales of sirens in the waters around Ireland, mythical creatures who lured sailors to their doom with their enchanting music. I don't know if what I saw was a siren or just a figment of my imagination, influenced by the eerie atmosphere of the causeway, but that melody and the sight of the mysterious figure have stayed with me. I come from a remote island called Rendova, located in the Solomon Islands, and have since moved overseas. Across from our island is another one called Tetepare. The story of Tetepare is really interesting, because it was abandoned completely by the inhabitants a few centuries ago. 
Just like the villagers fled the island to come to neighboring islands such as my own, here we are a few centuries later. Because of the lack of humans on the island, it is known for its biodiversity, and a few researchers come every now and again to have a look. If you are looking for cool remote places to travel, I highly recommend it. The interesting part of Tetapare for me was, why did everyone just leave? If you were a villager back in those days, it would have been a great place to live. Volcanic soil to grow crops, an abundance of fresh water, animals that are easy to hunt. The official story told is that there was a great sickness, and people were dropping like flies left and right. So, the villagers fled to get away from the sickness. However, the island is known to be very big, so realistically, if you wanted to get away from others, it wouldn't be too hard, because you could be self-sufficient on other parts of the island. The story told to me growing up is a little bit different. Back in those days, we loved to fight. A war canoe from my island Rendova arrived on Tetapare to fight. However, upon arrival, they were met with numerous unburied dead bodies. All the large canoes that belonged to the Tetapare people were gone. To leave so hastily, and to not even properly bury your dead, is a really weird thing. Because it was back in those days, the first thought was that a spirit had done this to these people. However, the people from Rendova decided to set up villages against better judgment. In due time, they also fled, because the spirit that had decimated the population of the Tetapare people apparently attacked the newly set upon villagers there. Ever since, the island has continued to remain uninhabited, except for the few ecologists the tourists come to visit at. Now in the present day, we go to Tetapare to maybe have a picnic or go hunting. We are, however, extremely cautious because it is believed that the island is still extremely wild. And because of the lack of humans, that spirits run amuck there. I have some weird stories about going hunting there, but in any case, Tetapare is a completely mysterious island. I worked at a state park for a number of years on a 30-acre island that was mostly taken up by a 20-acre granite star-shaped fort from the 1820s. It was actively used through World War II. During the Civil War, it was used as a prison for Confederate maritime officers and political prisoners. Sounds creepy, right? It was. Only a few staff would stay overnight, and some nights I was there alone. The staff stayed in the upstairs of a brick building that was built about 1900. The upstairs had been converted into staff housing sometime in the 1960s, with five or six bedrooms, a kitchen, a small living room, and a big storage area. Two of the bedrooms were original to the place. The back stairs that led to the living quarters were wooden and old and loud when you walked up them. It was a big building, but when someone was walking up the stairs, you could basically hear it through the entire place. Back in 2006, another coworker and I were hanging out in the workshop downstairs at night, having a couple of drinks and listening to the stereo until bedtime. We were the only two people on the island. I woke up at about 2 a.m. and I could hear my partner walking down the stairs. I didn't think much of it, because sometimes we would forget to lock the main door before bed, and one of us would get up in the night to do it. In the morning, when we were making coffee, I said, Hey, did we forget to lock the door? I heard you going downstairs in the night. He looked at me and said, I thought that was you. That was our introduction to the stair ghost. It actually became so common that it wasn't even spooky anymore. It was just kind of like, oh, there's the stair ghost again. Also, when I brought it up to a woman who had worked there for many years, she was like, oh yeah, the stair ghost, like it was nothing. 
A few years later, I was alone on the island in the off-season, when the park was closed, but it was during the day. I had just woken up and was in the kitchen, when I heard someone coming up the stairs. I figured that the labor crew must have arrived for the day and someone was coming to talk to me. So the very clear, loud steps get to the top landing and stop. I'm waiting for the door to open, but it never does. So after a minute, I go over and open it. Nothing. I walk to the front of the building and look out at the pier. No boat. Nobody else was there, and the labor crew never came out that day. I know that was a lot of words for relatively little, so I'll leave you with one more story from this place, though I do have some more. Another of my co-workers was staying out there by herself, but she had her dog with her, a very mellow golden retriever. She said that at about 2 a.m., which was the time that most of the really weird crap would happen, her dog woke up and started barking fervently at the door to the bedroom. This obviously freaked her out, so she figures maybe he has to pee or something. She opens the door and her dog runs out into the hallway. It's one long hallway with bedrooms on one side and a storage area on the other, and the dog is running up and down the hallway, peeing and crapping while running and barking like it was completely terrified of something. I never did have a good feeling in that place, though I also never heard of anything terrible happening in that particular building. There were deaths on the island, of course. Who knows, it was a farm before the government bought it, and Native Americans used it for thousands of years before that. So... Who knows what it could have been. I'm not sure we'll ever know. My girlfriend and I went camping this summer on Mears Island. We didn't know too much about the island, aside from the fact that it has some of the best old-growth forests in British Columbia, and that there's the campground and hostel and a small village there. When we got there, we went exploring and felt fine checking out the abandoned cars and rotting docks, as well as going inland along the waterways. We decided to go check out the lake around dusk, since we were told that there was a boardwalk and a boat available for use. As we walked there in high spirits, we listened to the birds. It was a quick walk, only 15 to 20 minutes from the campsite. Once we hit the lake, the atmosphere changed, however. All animal noises ceased. It was complete silence. It was very eerie. At the time, nobody vocalized anything, but my girlfriend and I later discussed the experience and both agreed that we felt uneasy and in danger. We were with a third who I didn't ask the feelings of. I didn't feel comfortable going out on the boat, so I stayed on the dock. My girlfriend and the third person with us went out for a few minutes but felt too creeped out and paddled back quickly. Nighttime had fallen and we decided that it was time to head back to camp, since I know silence generally equals predators. We quickly walked back and once we passed the threshold of where we had originally stopped hearing all the noises, animals and birds could be heard in the distance. It was a quiet walk back as we were intent to listen for anything behind us. I know it doesn't sound very scary or eventful. I figured it was probably a black bear or a cougar, but I've encountered those before, and I've never felt threatened by one, particularly not in advance. Cougars could definitely be the reason, though. They said that the big cats stay farther away than that. I wouldn't have thought much of it, except that today, I learned that the island is a Bigfoot sighting hotspot and has a good deal of First Nations lore about wild men and Sasquatch, and the thought creeped me out. 
Has anyone else ever had a similar experience of not really encountering anything, but feeling like you're on the verge? I am located in the twin islands of Trinidad and Tobago. There is generally a culture of supernatural entities and folklore that is present in everyone that lives in the country. I've always encountered ghosts periodically in my life, but two days ago I saw something that really disturbed me. I was by myself in my kitchen window at around 2.30 am. I live in a three-story apartment building, and I live on the third floor. Located just outside my window, about 150 meters away, is a church that is also three stories, with the bottom level being the church, and the other parascending levels seem like a house. I was looking out of my window, onto the windows of the church, when I saw the silhouette of what seemed to be a man on the top level of the church. I began to peer at this thing, and upon staring at it, it moved from facing west and slowly turned south, staring directly at me. Then, suddenly, it backed up and seemed to materialize into the wall behind it, like it melded into it. I know this sounds pretty unbelievable, but I'm scared out of my mind. I don't know what I saw. I have no thoughts on what it might be. I'm also getting nightmares frequently these days. I don't know if they're connected or not. While on vacation in Japan last year, I stayed at an Airbnb near the Daigo Shrine in Kyoto. On my last night in town, I came back to my Airbnb at about 11.40pm on a Monday night. Mind you, I had no alcohol or drugs in my system when this happened, and I was wide awake. There's a shrine that you have to walk past on a walkway that goes to and from the Airbnb to other areas of town. It was three city blocks long by two blocks going both sides. As the layout goes, there were ditches at the foot of the walls, followed by a row of plants alternating all the way down, and then there was a walkway in the middle, with a museum on the right, a whole shrine and palace at the fork. I walk into the walkway of the shrine and I ask myself this question, why are there two kids hopping a wall? As I see these two little figures hop the wall to my right, I pause and watch what's happening. As they both get down, they run across the path and run all the way to the end of the path by the fork and wait there. I was walking single file. They stand there for a few minutes. I walk a little closer because that was the way to the Airbnb, and I make eye contact with these things. They were about three to four feet tall, very slim but proportionate, with a bigger head and pointed ears as white as snow. Their eyes were as big as our eye sockets, but black. Normally you can tell if someone is wearing clothes at a small distance. I was maybe 15 to 20 yards from them, but they had no sign of clothing. After making eye contact, both of them go running around the corner that I had to turn. You could also see their shadows on the walls behind them. But I slowed down to give these things space. I was freaking out a little bit at this point. As I turned the corner, they were gone. I'm walking back to my Airbnb and I sensed that I was being followed, but I couldn't hear or see anything. I have no idea what I saw. Aliens? Something else? I don't know. I've seen some really strange things in the Navy. This is one of the two strangest things that I've seen during my career at sea. 
We were in the South Atlantic Ocean at the time, northwest bound on a course for what ultimately would be the U.S. Gulf, coming from the Cape of Good Hope. It was February 1995. I was on duty on the bridge at the time, and I remember going inside the chart room to fix the ship's position. We had Omega, Lawrence C, SatNav, and some early GPS models. I don't have the exact position, but I do remember that the nearest land was the island of St. Helena, and using the dividers, I remember that I reckoned we were about a thousand nautical miles or less broadly south-southwest off of the island. People need to understand that what I saw was not bioluminescent worms or other marine organisms. This light that I saw was very different. I've seen plenty of all that more than anybody would ever want to see when I was serving aboard ships in the Persian Gulf. This was like a lit marine floodlight inside the sea that produced a green light. It seemed stationary to an observer aboard my vessel because whatever it was was moving at exactly the same speed with my vessel, on exactly the same course, submerged and abeam. The phenomenon lasted for about 10 minutes, no entry was made in the log, we did not report this to a senior officer or the skipper, and I just cracked some jokes with the remainder of the bridge team, trying to convince them that it was bioluminescent marine organisms. One of the personnel on duty that night on the bridge had also convinced himself that it was worms, and he tried to help me convince the others. The US Navy and the US Coast Guard never got to hear about this. I was young, my career was just starting, and I didn't want anything to do with anomalous phenomena. I definitely did not want to be interviewed by senior officers ashore, trying to prove to them that I'm not Fox Mulder, nor did I want to get any odd remarks on my personnel file. As far as I know, US Navy subs do not have floodlights that work when they're submerged. I have no freaking idea what this was. I suppose it could have been Russians or something or someone else entirely. Were someone to ask me today about this, I would still deny everything, and I've never spoken to anyone in the US Navy or US military or US Coast Guard about this, nor do I want to. I'm pretty sure that they have a pretty good idea what it is in the US Navy, and I'm sure plenty of other officers and NCOs have seen the same thing. I'm sure they have all filed reports and I'm really not curious of ever finding out what this is. Just to give you an idea of who I am, I am a 13-year-old, able-minded girl. I've never been suspected of any sort of mental illness and I have no medical problems other than asthma and tinnitus. I was born in Arizona. I currently live on a very small Caribbean island that I will not be sharing the name of for privacy reasons. I am a science-based individual. Last night at about 10 p.m. it got really windy all of a sudden, which was odd considering that it hadn't been stormy at all. When I looked out at the ocean, it was flat, smooth as silk. I decided to ignore what my gut was telling me, and my father and I went outside. What I saw will stick with me for the rest of my life, however much longer that will be, which, due to what I've seen, I don't think will be much longer. We saw three red lights in the sky, at the top of the mountain. Of course, because of how stubborn my father is, he told me that it was probably some kind of military craft, Dutch marines or something. But once we went back inside and told my mother, she believed a portion to each of our stories. My father, who believed it was just the military doing some sort of training, and me, who believed it was a UFO, of the words true nature that is, simply an unidentified flying object. Whether it was from another country or another world, I wasn't sure. And my mother, well, she believes that it was some kind of government spy or experiment sort of thing. I found my mother's estimate more likely than my father's, until about 30 minutes ago. I saw someone, well, 
something. I'm not sure what it is or was. It was on top of one of the flat points on the mountain. Subsequent to us seeing the lights up on the mountain, I asked my friend if she saw the lights too. She said that she did. We're planning on hiking the trail that goes around the island to check it out. We're thinking about waiting until something more major happens until we investigate the situation in the off chance that my father is correct. Update number one, May 26th of 2020. Today I was hiking for one of my school clubs and I saw some blood on the trail. Maybe goat blood? I'm not sure what the blood was from, but I have a feeling that it's related to that thing I saw in the sky. Update number two, May 27th, 2020. I just found out that three goats that are on a Caribbean goat farm sort of thing are missing. I think that something is eating them. Update number three, May 31st, 2020. I spoke to an archaeologist here because I wanted another adult's opinion. He told me that there is a certain legend on certain islands that every 177 years, red lights will appear in the sky or mountain, and things emerge from the mountain and will eat and drink and do all that they need to do to survive. He said if they're real, they're more like demons or spirits and won't go away until they're stopped but they can only be stopped and seen and interacted with by certain groups of people of their choice. It seems that they have chosen teenagers to fight them off. I hope this doesn't end bad for us. I can only hope. Update number four, June 1st, 2020. Today at around eight, I was sitting in my room doing homework and I heard a tapping sort of sound, like something was on my roof all of a sudden, I heard a screeching sound, and the tapping was over. I was too scared to go outside and look. Final update, June 2nd, 2020. Today I went hiking for my school group, and two of my friends walked up past the part of the trail where we were supposed to stop at. When we were all walking back down, one told me that she saw a dark-skinned woman, like a native or Hispanic woman but on the darker side, hiding in the bushes. She said that she didn't recognize this woman, which they would have if they were a local. Our airport and the ferries are all shut down, so nobody can get on the island. And my other friend told me that when he walked up, he heard a voice speaking almost in a whisper, and what he thought sounded like a native language to the Caribbean. I found a pile and shrine and altar sort of thing slightly off the trail, and we all agreed not to tell anybody just for the sake of convenience. We're keeping in close contact on WhatsApp and Snapchat. If anybody knows what's going on or has any suggestions or ideas, please let me know. These events took place in British Columbia in the summer of 2018, June and July to be precise. The events that I'm going to describe took place in two different locations. The first occurrence was by Gold River, near the Mawachat First Nation. The second was by Cathedral Grove. My buddy and I were spending the summer on the island. We were staying in Royston, where we both work. We decided to go spend a weekend in the wilderness. We planned to go rock climbing all day by Gold River, and in the evening, find a quiet spot to stargaze. The first part of the day was uneventful, beautiful, and sunny. We decided to camp by Gold River boat launch. For those unfamiliar, it's at a dead end. The only way to go farther is to take a ferry. There's nothing around except trees, valleys, the sea, and an abandoned little parking lot, which nature has slowly taken over. The only civilization nearby is right across our improvised camping spot, the First Nation of Mawachat. We went to bed at about 2 a.m. It was a perfect night. Not a sound, not a cloud, and a lot of stars. It was beautiful. 
Now here comes the interesting part. Not long after we went into our sleeping bag in the tent, we heard the distinct noise of monkeys. Literally, it sounded like chimpanzees, like we were at the zoo. We both heard it, and it was loud and distinct. It gave us goosebumps. We knew it was impossible because there's no such thing around there. We tried to rationalize it. Initially, we thought it could have been birds we weren't used to, or some small animals, maybe. The sound repeated itself about three times, and then nothing. Everything returned to its quiet state. We've talked to a few locals who'd been staying on the island for a long time about the incident, and we couldn't get a straight answer. About a month later, we went to Cathedral Grove and spent an afternoon there with friends. By the end of the evening, around 7 p.m., we heard the same weird chimpanzee sounds. It seemed like the sound was following us. It went on a few times again and then went quiet. We got kind of creeped out and we left. I don't know if anybody else has ever experienced something similar, but it was certainly interesting. In every city, there is a place that local residents are aware of. Whether it's a home, an office, an abandoned building, or a park that everyone has heard the rumors about, there is always something haunted. The story begins with a murder, a suicide, or some tragic death, and decades later, tales circulate of the paranormal activity within the area. Some believe while others scoff. But, either way, everybody knows of the place. I want to share with you the haunted history of Paveglia Island. Paveglia is a small, 17-acre island located in the Venetian Lagoon between the cities of Venice and Lido. In the past few decades, the island has taken upon the reputation of being one of the most haunted locations on Earth. Paveglia holds many tales of paranormal activity, going back for centuries. Local residents refused to set foot on the island, believing that they would be cursed by those who haunt it. The history of Paveglia is a dark one, shrouded in death. There are beliefs that the Romans had used it to isolate victims of the plague and the mentally ill. The first recorded settlement on the island was in 460 AD, of people fleeing the invading barbarians on the mainland. Over the centuries, Paveglia was the scene for many battles as people sought to raid or control it. During the Middle Ages, the island was designated as a quarantine area and a burial site for those who contracted the Black Death. Over the next few centuries, Paveglia served as a fort storage of shipment goods, and continued as an isolation station for those infected with the plague. In the 1920s, the island was set up as a hospital for the mentally ill and the elderly. Soon, stories started to emerge of patients encountering ghosts along with the counts of being possessed. There is the legend of a doctor who conducted medical experiments on the hospital's residents that was driven insane by the spirits to committing suicide. In 1968, the facility was closed and abandoned. Today, the island has been deemed as one of the most haunted places on the planet. Historical researchers estimate that more than 100,000 people died on Paveglia in its history and many of those souls are believed to still reside there. Locals won't go there, and the fishermen steer clear of its waters. It's said that a few fishermen had caught human remains in their nets. The few paranormal investigators that braved Paveglia had reported encountering a lot of paranormal activity, with claims of being attacked by unseen forces. In 2014, the Italian government sold the island to a developer in hopes that the island could be made into a resort. Currently, rumors on the internet have said that the workers sent to survey the island had an experience and refused to return.